Yo, is the mic on, Mike? And turn that mic on, Mike And pour us another one Let's do it right, though, Mike We feeling nice, though, Mike Gather round, gather round And turn that mic on, Mike And turn that mic on, Mike Yeah, garage drinks with Mike Woo! Fia Ofa Amosili, welcome to my garage Cheers How are you? I'm good, thank you, how are you? Good, 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 good It's really good to have you here. Thank you for coming. Mm-hmm. Thank um, you for having me. <laughs> how are you feeling? You, you seem pretty tense. Um, no, no, I'm not tense. I'm just yeah. um, getting rid of some heat. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. Did you like the set this morning? Yep, I did. I did. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. And everyone else was like... It was pretty hard, eh? Pretty stuff. You see me lying down? I was dead. Well, I think I was lying down, so I probably wouldn't have seen you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, hey, it's really good to have you here. Um, man... You have so much stuff. Like, I don't even know almost where to begin because you've got so much stuff that you've done, which is really cool. Mm. And I feel quite honoured to have you here. <laughs> um, January, um, uh, for you or for like listeners that don't know, January is quite a strong female month, which is great. There's, I got like really good females lined up, mm-hmm. which I started with like a, a Tongan Maori doctorate last week. Awesome. And now you're on. And then there's like a school teacher that follows you. Um, so it's really cool, man. It's really cool. And I love celebrating, like, especially our brown women that are real high achievers. Yeah. Because um, not just because you're achievers, but also because you inspire, like, you know, other yeah. younger women and guys as well, which is awesome. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> uh, my humble garage, as you can see, like, is literally just a garage. Um, Very comfortable, though. Yeah, man. And I'm glad that you came here, like, comfortable as well, because yeah. I like people to be comfortable. <laughs> yeah. um, so I might just go all the way back, okay. right? Because um, when I first found out your name was Fi, I stupidly assumed that it was like Fiona, which is not. It's Fia O'o. Mm-hmm. Uh, am I saying that the right way? Yeah, that's correct. Yes. Yeah, yeah. so where do you get your name from? So my, from Fia O'o is from my grandmother. Um, yes. She passed away when I was born. Yeah. So I was given that name, um, which when I came to New Zealand, yeah. I was going to go with my uh, first name, or my middle name, Maria, in school. Right. But I held on to Fia O'o being, because um, I wanted to keep my heritage in school. Yeah, okay. And I'm so glad that I did. Yeah. Because, you know, her name lives on. 100%. Do you know much about her? No, not yeah, at all. Okay. Um, I was brought up mainly on my dad's side, so um, okay. I just know that her name was Fio'o and she was from a, a massive family and, yeah, well, very loving. Well, you're definitely loving. taking the name to extremes. Yeah. Because <laughs> now you. there's not many, every time a name is said, it's only ever associated with you. Mm. Yeah, and as you said, like, when you said Fee, yeah. you're not the first person that calls me Fiona. Right. Um, right. Once they think it's Fee, then I get caught up to talk um, in, a, in, a, in, in awards or at um, clubs, you know, as it's Fiona. Fiona. <laughs> and I'm just like, but then I stand up and I just do you say. correct them? Yeah, I do. That's what yeah. I'm talking about, man. <laughs> you have to. I you mean, have to, yeah. You're not known as Fiona, you're Fee yeah. And you can say Fee because you've shortened it just to, to help them out. Mm. Yeah. I don't think you should shorten it. <laughs> I think you should just like always say that. No, because I had to because I was getting called Fiobo in the newspapers and, you know, wow. it sounded like South African. <laughs> so I was like, uh, and my brother-in-laws, they still mock me to this day because I was down as Fiobo <laughs> from Australia. Who did that? South Africa? So, uh, no, it was... Um, Australia. Some, yeah, no, it was in the UK, some oh, newspaper okay. in the UK. <laughs> Ignorant, eh? Very. There's so many different athletes from like Africa, from... Um, different parts of the Pacific as well. They have real complicated names. Yep. The least you can ever do is try and pronounce someone's name the right way. Or even ask someone. It's that simple. Yeah, you just yeah. have to say, oh, look, can you say this? Or You still hear on commentators yeah. doing it. Like It's frustrating. It's very frustrating to hear. Yeah, But it's, to us, it's the norms now, though. Right. You, we just hear it. And I mean, they're not, most, most of the people don't correct it. Yeah. And I just hope that you know, they just stop it and, and do correct it because that's... That's our heritage. We're holding that name and we're holding how we say it. Yeah. yeah. We're trying to keep our language alive. I guess people get sick of having to correct their own name all the time, eh? Mm, you do. That's why fees. Easy. Fee. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, you and I have something similar, something in common, which yeah. I don't realise. I don't think we had anything in common. <laughs> no, <laughs> we like to train. Yeah. But you and I were both born in the islands. Mm-hmm. However, yeah. you came over here when you were five, uh, born in Samoa. Yeah. Um, what are your villages in Samoa? So I'm from, so my dad's from Fileula and Alisa, and that's in Apia, mm. Bolu. Um, and my mother's from Fongapo and Savai. Right. And that's another little island outside of... Um, yeah, um, a beautiful island. Yeah, very beautiful. Yeah. I've been there a few times. Yeah, so born there when I was five years old. Um, mm. I'm from a big family, so I've got three brothers and um, four sisters. 
Mm. And I don't remember much of um, my life growing, in Samoa, up, there, growing yeah. up there at all. But I do um, recall that my parents were hard workers on the land. Right. And my brothers and sisters followed that. So we used to sell everything at the markets and that. Here in New Zealand? No, in Samoa. Right, Before okay. um, coming over. So, so they're, like, they were, they're like plantation workers. Yep. Right. And my dad also was a lab technician. But lab they, technician. Mm, a right. lab technician. He studied late in life and became a lab technician. That's cool. Yeah, very cool. And then he um, became a bus driver okay. just before we came to New Zealand. So okay. Those a, beautiful, colourful buses. The, uh, Those the ones? music, the nightclubs. So it's called a, a <laughs> yeah, bus nightclub. I like nightclubs, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so he was a, a bus driver before we came to New Zealand. But yeah, so I just remember them working really hard um, yeah. and bringing us over. Yeah. Um, when we came to New Zealand... Um, Dad was already ha- already had a job here. My brothers were already set up, right. so they had come. I think a few years or a year before us, right? Just to set up, right? And like the typical island families that do move over, you stay with aunties and uncles, so you're all jammed up in one one little house. So it took us about a few months to get our own little place with all of us. So there were seven of um, so there was nine of us all together in one house. Yeah, man. Seven kids and your parents. So right? eight kids and eight kids mm, eight and kids your parents and my parents ten. Yes, yeah, Tim. See, yeah. that's why I'm not good at maths. That's okay. <laughs> so when you first came over and you said you were you all staying together with another family? Yes. How big is that house? A three bedroom. Mate. And then there's a there was a garage, so. Yeah. And that's I mean, that's how we do it in the islands, yeah. though. We all jam up in like a, a house. Yeah. Or we sleep outside, like underneath the filly oars and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So when you first came here, were you sharing the room with obviously all your sisters, eh? Mm, basically, and yeah. the cousins. Yeah. So we were there for like a few months and then um, we right. had enough to get our own house because dad and my older brothers and sister were working. Right. Where do you come in like um, your, um, the eight of you? Where, where are you? So I'm second to youngest. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So the age difference between yeah, must us be young ones and our older bro- yeah. brothers are like massive. So what's the difference between you and the oldest brother? So my older brother's like 54. Okay, so he's so, like about 14 years. Yep, 14 years. Um, don't so say when, my age, but yeah, he's I about I won't say your age. <laughs> I'm not that stupid. <laughs> so when you were five, though, he's like 19, 20, and he's working. Yeah. Right, and probably the other older brothers as well are working? Yes. Mm. They're going to school? No. No. Yeah. See, that, okay. that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I can pick this up yep. really fast, yeah. Yep. So they um, were working to get us through. Mm. So and that's why I have so much respect and love mm. for my older siblings because mm. if it wasn't for them I wouldn't be uh, reaping all these awards now. Because um, they came over, they just worked, mm. and they what sort worked of jobs were they doing? Just factory work, warehouse, eh? warehouse work, Shift work. and um, what what, surprised, what shocks me is the hard work that they started raw at the bottom, mm. and so now the big managers in their jobs is because they maintained that work ethic from. You yeah. know, from back on the island right through to now, yeah. um, and they started at the bottom, and now the big bosses, and, yeah. and that's why I still um, keep trying to strive to be better yeah. than before because of what they do. Yeah, yeah. they, and they gave would have up started their, probably on minimum wage and mm, those warehouses, eh? Yeah. Yeah. And they, um, yeah, they gave up the education so we young ones can yeah. can educate ourselves and and be better than them. But yeah. amazing, eh? Those mm. sort of sacrifices. Yeah. See, I was fortunate. I was lucky. I managed to get to the end of sixth form in Tonga. Yeah. Uh, but we didn't have a seventh form at the time. So I came over here to do seventh form. Mm. Uh, but I was still like, I was working at McDonald's part-time. I was yeah. working in warehouses, lifting aluminium, graveyard shifts. Yeah. Just to sort of, just to make a bit of extra to, you know. Help out, eh? Yeah, yeah. But you need to, this country, man, this country's about money. Mm. Like over in the islands, it's very different. And I think that's one of the biggest clashes for people coming over. Yeah. It was for me because like in the islands, there's always going to be food. There's always coconut trees. You've got yeah. a plantation. Mm. There's the water. You can always fish. You're never going to go hungry. Whereas over here, like if you don't have money, man, your family's going to starve yeah. or you'll be on the streets. Um, are you going to commit crime to go and get yeah. that stuff? So yeah, yeah, there's yeah. a big cycle with it. Yeah, mm. very ruthless. Very. It can be, it can be. Yeah. Especially if people that come over and they don't have much support here in New Zealand mm. and they're quite isolated. Yeah. Um, but then, yeah, to get to crime, I think it's, there's, it's not much of a distance between a few things happening in your life yeah. that just change situations and before you know it, you're somewhere you never thought you would be. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you came over here, you were five. Yeah. Um, Speak much much English? No, I yeah. knew no English at all. Okay. So um, going to school was quite tough for me. Mm. Um, 
but I was quite an active kid and I, I kind of like got along with everybody quite easily. Yeah. So, um, But my older brothers and sisters, because they sort of got a, a bit of English in them now from working, yeah. you know, they'll teach us um, bits and bobs of, of English. And we never spoke English at home. So we go to school. Yeah. Um, try and speak English like and come home and, and speak then Samoan. Speak Samoan. Yeah. Mm. And I kept that. And that's why I'm so happy that I did that because um, now I can still speak the language. So you're still fluent in Samoan? Yes, yeah. So I can still hold a conversation with an adult. And, that's amazing. And, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that I can. I'm, yeah. It, the main reason was is because my grandmother and grandfather, they couldn't speak English. Right. And so we right. had to speak to them in, in Samoan. Then so, we have a choice. Yeah, we don't yeah. have a choice. It's not like you can go in sign language. But, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, it's, I'm very happy that I kept that. Yeah. Mm. Um, which primary school did you did you go to? I went to Kingsford Primary School. So Where's that? it was across the road from where we lived. So it's in um, Kairanga, so Mangere East. Mangere, okay, mm. okay. Yeah. And you did all your primary there. Did all my primary there, and then moved to Kijuli Intermediate, which was like mm, 500 meters or okay. to a k down the road. Yeah. And then from there, I went to Aldi College. Yeah. What was it like, like um, growing up at that time, and what was it like in your house? Because I know um, struggles real, mm. right? But what was it like for you as like um, second to youngest growing up in your family amongst that struggle at the time? Like, what are your sort of memories? Um, a lot of it was happy memories mm. um, and a lot of teachings. Right. Because by the time um, you know we had gotten our our house in Mangere, like um, Kairanga Street. My brothers had have gotten married, the older two, and you know they had moved out, so they had their own little family. Yeah. And so from us, we had to grow quite fast because mm. we were helping um, my parents because we got we came in 1985, but then my dad was um, sick in 1987, so okay. he had a heart um, operation. Okay. And so that made him not work, and so from then on. How we, old is he at this time? So he was about. So late 40s. Yes. Yeah, late 40s. And so he had to stay home. So he wasn't allowed to work anymore. So he was on the sickness benefit. Mm. And so we had to sort of help out, out. Yeah, figure out how we're going to do things. And so we took our mentality from what we, what we did in um, the islands, like yeah. selling yeah, yeah, vegetables yeah. and all that kind of stuff and food. We took that. And so we started going to the markets. So yeah. we started in Otara. Yes. Did the Otara market. What would you sell? So we started making um, kekesenga, so the flour. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Because yeah. my, my brothers and sisters were quite good cooks, yeah. and so they helped mum out. And so right. we had, we did that, we did German buns. Right. Yeah, we did German Delicious. buns. Delicious. Yeah. <laughs> so we supplied some vegetables and that in the garden. Yeah. Um, sell that stuff. So anything that we did plant on our land or we made at home, we'll go sell. Right. So that'll be like three o'clock in the morning on a um, Saturday, Saturday morning, we'll get up and start cooking. We'll all help out. And then... Um, go to the markets on the Saturday. So we sort of had to find other incomes of helping out. Yeah. How much would you make at the market like on a Saturday? Oh, probably about close to $300. Yeah. Which back in that day, was that good? Or? That was heaps. Yeah. That was yeah. heaps yeah. back then. Like right now it's yeah. probably not much Yeah, at I all. understand. But back but in the late 80s, it's probably a yeah, good... Yeah, it's know. pretty good. And so, yeah, so we started that up and um, then we started increasing the markets, going to Avondale. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. Avondale. And it got to the point where I was getting a bit older and then we were going to Hamilton. Wow. So I drive to Hamilton. Yeah. Um, my dad would drive there and I'd drive back. Yes. And I was still, I was in my teens, like yeah, okay. early okay. 14. <laughs> okay. Just to help out, yeah. So it's just us. Yeah. Um, we, my brothers would go fishing okay. um, with dad. Just off the Or they, they the had rocks. a little um, dinghy boat. Okay. Yeah, so they'll go fishing or they'll go do flounders up in Waiuku. Yeah. Um, they'll come back and put them on strings and then me and my little sister and my one above me will walk down the street and sell it to the houses, $5 for some fish on a string. Wow. Mm. That's um, like the islands. Yeah, it was, it was. we did exactly the same thing. And, you know, it's... In Samoa, did they use a whistle as well? <laughs> when, oh, no. In Tonga, you hear the whistle down mm. the street, you know it's fish being sold. Oh no, we just went to the fish. door and knocked. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes you'll like knock on the door and it's your friends, and then we'll be like, yeah, what look was that at. Like? It was kind of, it was embarrassing. Yeah. Okay, I'm not going to say it was kind of, yeah, it was yeah, embarrassing, yeah. but yeah. then you'll just be like, oh, is your parents home? Yeah. And then just sell your fish off. Yeah. 
you know, go home, give the money. And that, that my parents would say, don't ever be embarrassed, yeah. you know, um, because you'll see what you'll get at the end of it. Yeah. And that was it. I mean, we were getting fed. Um, it taught us how to speak to people as well. So, mm. yeah, there was a lot of teachings in um, my upbringing. Sounds quite rich. And that stuff as well is actually learning how to sell stuff. Yeah. Um, I learned quite skills. at a young age how to sell stuff and how yeah. to take um, bargainers. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Hustling. Hustling. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of hustling going on in, at the markets. Um, those are really great memories. I wanted to ask you something a little bit different though. Like when you were growing up, you ever experienced any bullying or anything at school? No. Mm. Um, I'm not going to say I was a bully. Okay. But I, um, I never... I never saw, like, no one really came no up to me. No one ever tried to bully you? No. no. Tease I was you? Probably with my name. Right. Yeah, and right. I had, um, and my hair. Right. What was wrong um, with your hair? I had an afro. Right. Yeah, okay. so, um, you know, when back in the day when you have nits. Yeah. And then your mum just cuts your hair off yep. for the sake of it. Yeah. Instead of we'll going to get some treatment. Right. So, we were those kids, um, if we had some sea like I mean she'll cut, sea she'll, she'll cut it off and so right. not a hairdresser or anything and so you'll go to school and have your frizzy island here. Yeah. And one time I was in class and we had to do um there was an overhead projector and they wanted to do a, a, a what do you call it? A shade of your face. So you stay in like the overhead projectors here and you'll stand here and okay. they had to do a, a shading of your head. Oh. So my shading went off the paper because of my afro. It's, I, got, I got teased from that, right. but I just, I just took it off. It is what it is. Yeah, it is what yeah. it is. I mean, you know, it was just kind of embarrassing back then, but yeah. if I think back at it, I still remember it because it was quite, um, yeah. What was the sort of uh, mix of kids at, at that school? Is that, is that dominantly well, like a mixture of like PI Māori kids or is it? Back in the day it was, yes. Right. There was a few right. um, Malangi kids as well as Pacific Island kids. Yeah. And there was a kohanga reo, um at that school. Which I started at in Kuangaro first. Wow! Because I, I had no English, so they put me in the Maori class. <laughs> I don't know why they thought that. I guess this is before the time of them setting up, like you know, Samoan units and Tongan units in primary yeah. schools. Yeah. Yeah, they put me in Kuangaro, so I learned how. You wouldn't to be the only islander in the Kuangaro if they put you in there, would you? I I didn't know. I, <laughs> I just I can't remember, but all I remember was playing with the poi and and just. There's a lot of, you know, call fuel for most illegal to ingo. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Then, yeah. Trying to bunch all the brown people together. They must have thought I was Māori, but it's like, hey, I don't have any English, so. Right. Yeah. Oh, well, you learned a bit of Māori, a bit of te reo. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> no, it wasn't. Yeah. Best way to um, know New Zealand is to go through their native tongue. That's right, mm. 100%. Mm. Um, so those are your, like, primary intermediate years. Mm. And then which high school did you go to? Aurere College. Aurere College. Mm. Famous college. Very famous. Yeah. yeah. You enjoy it there? I did. Yeah. I did. Um, enjoyed it because, you know, I love sport. And so right. I, sp- I played all the sports in Aurelia College. I just, if, if, I, if I look back at it, sports is what kept me in school. Okay. There's a lot of um, activity going on outside of school and that and with like little gangs and, and kids just wanting to leave school. But, um, yeah, that's what kept me in school was, not the brightest kid right. academically, but right. uh, yeah, I enjoyed sport. And so I right. went to school just to basically play sport. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask you, it's just gone out of my mind. Um, <laughs> but if you were, um, if it was mainly sport that you enjoyed, what type of sport was it that you were doing? I played netball. Okay. So um, netball was my main sport. Yeah. But I played, I was in athletics, so I'll go to track and I played, I had discus shot put, um, we had soccer, hockey, so all sports. Mm. Um, I even tried basketball. Okay. So I took what I learned in netball to play basketball, right. um, volleyball, you name it. I think any sport I would play. Yeah. Mm. Um, and is this before, did they have, not have uh, girls rugby at the time? No. No, okay. Um, already to college, we didn't have a rugby team. I think there were some, they had teams, but... No, right. I didn't. I wasn't playing rugby. Yeah, I was only playing bora at lunchtime, and that kind of stuff. Or, or touch, but oh, no yeah. rugby. Um, also, does it cost all these sports activities? Do they cost? Not when you're playing at school. Okay. Just if you're going on uh, trips or tournaments and that, they'll ask for some money. But no, not at school. That's why um, I only played school sport. 
Right, yeah. right. Yeah, because I think now at the moment, man, like the fees can quickly climb pretty high, especially if you're in high school doing stuff. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I find it with, <laughs> with our kids. <laughs> yeah. Um, Do you play, to, um, play sport and sport? Well, sport? no. My son plays in a club, oh, okay. of course, which has fees. Um, but I think once he gets to high school, if he's playing, yeah. I think he'll prefer to play in college. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you say you don't really, didn't like too much of the academics in high school, which is fine because I don't think school academically is for everybody. Yeah. Because everyone gets every, something, something different out of being at school. Mm. Um, I think probably the most important thing it is for is for like social interaction, how to deal with other people. Yeah. yeah. Um, once you left, how old were you when you left um, RD? So I completed um, up to seventh form. Mm. And they call it year 13 now. So I left seventh form, went straight working full time. What were you um, doing? I was working at a pack and save manicure. Okay. So when I was 14, I um, applied to work part time. Yeah. Just kind of put this so, up before you. It's right. Yeah. Yeah. I applied to work part time at Pack and Save Manicure. Yeah. Um, so that was my first ever paid job. Yes. Um, and they rejected me because I wasn't 15. Okay. So I went in um, my Sunday skirt, my um, white blouse, and I went for an interview. And he said, oh, "Sorry, love, you have to be 15 when you to get the job." Right. So on my 15th birthday, I um, went back. Was then. sick. At lunchtime, and told dad to come pick me up. But I packed my same skirt and blouse in my bag, and told him to take me to Manicow. And I went back to the boss, and I said, "Oh, I'm I'm 15 today. Can I have my job?" On your <laughs> 15th birthday. On my 15th birthday, and I think just from then on, I was just like, because I wasn't embarrassed anymore. Like you know, I've been selling fish, I've been selling fruits yeah. on the road, yeah. and that kind of stuff. And so I was like, "No, I'm going to go back and help." So I told dad to take me, and the boss at the time, Ted, gave me the job. Mm. He was like, when do you want to start? And I said, I can start straight away. Mm. So then I started that weekend. Um, and that was my first ever paying job. And I was like, $4 something an hour. And I okay. was so stoked because I've never been paid before to work. Yes. Like with my parents, you don't get, you know, you, this is part of your life. Yes. But I was so stoked. And so at 15, um, I was working. Mm. And then got to when I finished school, I wasn't thinking about uni because I was thinking about helping my parents. Yeah. Um, so I decided to go full time at Pack and Save because I was at this time I had been introduced to rugby okay. and I enjoyed playing rugby and I had I'm finally playing for a club. Right, which so club was it? Auckland Maris. Okay, so, so I was playing for Auckland Maris. So finally got to pay for a club and I figured, okay, if I work um, Monday to Friday and play in the weekends, I can see where I go with rugby. Yeah. So I did that for two three years at uh, working full time in produce at Manukau. It's pretty cool. There's another thing we have in common. <laughs> My first ever yeah. job was working at um, TCF, Tonga Cooperative Federation, which is a supermarket in yeah. Nupalofa. Oh, I was 14 and I went to work there on my school holidays and it was like 80 cents an hour. Yeah. 80 cents an hour, which isn't much. Um, but my job was to package, because I was, I was little, I was skinny, <laughs> was package the um, groceries, you yeah. know, when they're buying their groceries. And also like when they buy like sacks of flour, sacks of sugar or like frozen boxes of lamb and boxes of chicken. Mm. My job was to carry that to their cars. And they were yeah. like 25 kilos, 50 kilos. And, but yeah, but we have the same, I, you know, Christmas week when mm. I was 14, I ended up working 80 hours wow. for Christmas week, right? Yep. 80 cents <clears throat> an hour. I got, on my paycheck came, well, pay cash, yeah. but on the pay slip, um, it said 80 hours equals 64 baanga. Mm. The pay lady had wrote it next to it, thank you, well done. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's 64. 64 baanga for 80 hours. And that was massive back then though? To was me it, it was. Mm. To me it was because um, um, there was a bike that I really wanted. Yeah. It was like an Asian, it was an Asian supermarket had this bike which had 21 speeds. Yeah. Which was unheard of. In Tonga, wow. and I really wanted this bike. The bike was like, I think I remember it's two hundred and seventy banga. Yeah. So, <laughs> so you still had, <laughs> still still had a long, <laughs> still a long way to go. But yeah, um, yeah, that's interesting. Um, but I can see already like the beginnings of like a work ethic mm. that um, you had, like yeah. starting from quite young, and it's quite a um, common theme amongst people that are really good achievers yeah. and having like a work ethic ingrained in them quite young that they just continue through with. Yeah. 
Um, you obviously you carry that same work ethic into when you started playing rugby. Yes. Mm. Yeah. I mean, sports or playing rugby kept me alive. Like as right. in, if I'm enjoying keeping active and I'm, I'm enjoying my job. And so, yes. yeah, so I was going to work Monday to Friday. It wasn't like working at Pack and Save wasn't my dream job. Yes. But playing sport, there was a purpose for that. It's, it's to help my family and so I can play my sport, you know, mm. parents and see that I'm, I'm achieving in that and, you know, they'll be happy for me to go ahead and play. Because dad loved me playing rugby, but my mum was 50-50. Right. Yeah, being a you know Pacific mum and seeing her daughter getting smashed around the field. Um, right. You know, it's something that she's never gonna. But she just accepted it because she saw how happy I was, and because I was working hard out um, throughout the week. So yeah, I mean, it's yeah, it's it's just uh, work ethic has been engraved in me since I was like pretty much walking around and just mm. watching my parents, and then work hard, mm. and then it's like as soon as I'm able to do what I can, as soon as I hit fifteen, when I'm able to get real money from other people, not my family, but from you know employers then you know I'm going to continue that sure yeah. sure um, any of your other siblings at this time are they into any sports or anything or is it just you um, my brother played right. rugby right um, he played for Auckland played a couple of um, yeah um, other regional teams but never really went further with it he was um, studying to be a chef at the time as well so he went to uni okay mm. Yeah, so we had to study a, chefing. Yeah, he became a chef, wow. and he was really good at it too, <laughs> pastry chef. Wow! So he took out a few competitions and that. Right, um, right. But never really cooked for us. I don't know why. <laughs> a man will go show off at all these competitions, but never come, home, come home and, and <laughs> cook the same things. <laughs> so I was like, oh, he's a good cook, but um, he's got all these awards, but we've never really seen him his work, yeah. <laughs> just photos of it. But I guess when he's at home, he's just wanting to have family time in that. Mm. Right. Does he still chef? No, he um, changed careers. Careers when he moved over to England. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. So and then he came back, but now he's back. Right. Yeah. And then me and him are quite close, so. That's yeah. great. So um, I, I could say that I'm living his rugby dream, I guess. <laughs> That's what I saw. <laughs> yeah. Well, your family must be really proud mm. of everything that you've achieved. Yeah, that they are. Yeah. And, and sometimes I get embarrassed about yeah. it, because um, everything I do achieve, they always try and celebrate it, and I. And I always think back that my family don't have much, and but they always put on something big. And you know, but that's just them. It's that's just that love that we've been born, born into. But um, yeah, they're very proud. I understand. Mm. Yeah, <clears throat> um, you come across as a very humble person, yeah. um, so I can understand how like when people try to celebrate you hard out, how it must feel a little bit um, like an imposter thing. Yeah, like you yeah. don't deserve it per se, even though you do. I, yeah, I brush it off. I, I just, understand. Yeah. I, yeah. Because they should be celebrating them. Like, yeah. it's, if it's not for them, yeah. I, I wouldn't be doing what, what I'm doing. Mm. Um, and that's how I've always thought, of, you know, it's not about me, it's about them and, and that kind of stuff, that mentality. Mm. Um, when I train, like, hard out, mm. I train for, the, for them. Mm. Um, so that's what you're thinking about when you're training hard out? Yeah. Yeah. You train hard out or I bring, and it's also, it's... How do I put it? It's like I train hard up because I know, um, like, this is what my dad wanted me to do. Mm. You know, he's pushed me so much in rugby. And so every time I do train hard, I think of him and I think about what my family have done. So a, a lot goes on in your mind when you train. I know I, people I know go um, through some dark places and that. But um, when you think about the goodness mm. of, um, and why you're here, the, your purpose, um, that just makes you train harder. Yeah. And... I try and bring my family along to train. I try and train my family because mm. I want them to um, to live long and stay healthy. I see that. I see yeah. you bring them to the gym, which is really good. Yeah. And some of them I see really push themselves. Mm. But you push them even more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what they say. I mean, um, I do some trainings outside of our gym trainings okay. um, for them. Yeah. Because some of them can't make it. But yeah. Um, yeah, they they work hard. Yeah. And I see them pushing hard because I know what they can get there. I know their limits because I've seen them push outside of the our gym. So, yeah. I, oh, they I, must I love can't. it though. Like they must thank you at the end of it, even though they hate it sometimes. Mm. But they must thank you though because they, I guess they do feel a bit better afterwards. Oh, they do. And they so, can see the path of like 
what they can achieve. Yeah, and I always tell them I'm not doing this because you know to hurt you guys. I'm doing it because you know you got young kids. I want you guys to be around a lot younger, and you guys are role models for the kids. Mm. If they see you lounging around and that, they're just going to do the same. Mm. So if you got active parents that just do anything like active, then you're going to have active kids. That's right. That's right. Um, yeah, it's really hard. Um, I think especially for our Pacific Island community as mm. well. Um, to sort of remain active, especially mm. when people start to get older and become parents and have busy lives and stuff, but it's still quite a very important part of like something that they can pass on to their next to their children mm. is that sort of ethic of like remaining healthy. Yeah. Um, but then in some ways, see, um, I also think as well that we're not set up. We haven't been set up properly to come into like a healthy system. Yeah. Where we're taught about stuff like eating and yeah. stuff that there's a lot of stuff at school I reckon that should be taught that's not taught. Stuff about managing your finances. Yeah. Um, stuff about how to um, work relationships, practical stuff, like yeah. real life stuff, yeah. you know, where there's a lot of emphasis in schools though on like a lot of sport, academics. Um, but yeah, but that's just my opinion. I'm yeah. like, I feel like a lot of Pacific Island, Maori especially, suffer a lot because they're not well set up to like enter the proper society, you know, with those sort of tools. Yeah. Uh, educate, like educating them yeah. of what they're getting get themselves into. And, yeah, and um, the keys yeah. to like the the proper keys to like how to live a healthy life and how to like get through good relationships and how mm. to manage your finance as well, which are such important things. Yeah, because I know in the, in the islands we're quite active over there. Um, yeah, well, we don't really have a choice. Yeah. Like if you're so working you're the working plantation, the land, you're yeah. working the plantation. So when you come here, it's a different story because you've got to work your eight to nine hours or ten hours for some people. A day, and then you've got other stuff going on, bills coming out, and, you know, you know, as you say, finances, and then you've got to try and squeeze in time with the family at night. So it's real, it's different, but yeah. education is the key. Yeah. So. Time management is also quite a big thing as well. Yeah. People can learn how to manage their time and their mm. days and stuff. There's always time for everything. Yeah, and that's I've always said that too. You know, you got 24 hours in a day. You only need about six. To seven hours sleep, yep. but the rest you've got the whole day to, yeah. to do fit everything else in. Yeah, and that's just how I've sort of done my manage time management throughout mm. my um, twenty six year life so far. <laughs> <laughs> You're awesome. <laughs> I love it. Um, <laughs> yeah, working. I at, saw um, you doing the math there. <laughs> no, I thought you were about to say your twenty six um, rugby career. <laughs> no, but how long is your has your was your rugby career? And the all the up. Black fans are all, They're all up, like when you were playing. So I was about 16 right. years old when I started playing. So a very long time. Very long time. Yep. And, then you know, I just retired. I, my last game was 2019 with the Barbers. Right. That's not very long ago. No. Right, no, right. So. Um, if we go back, so when you're working at Peck and Say, mm. right, and you're playing in the weekend for Marist, okay, is this the beginning? Are you getting paid for Marist? Do they pay? Never got, I've never been paid club rugby. Right, right. So females, we don't get paid to Males pay. get paid? Some males do. I know that, yeah. Right. And they get scholarships um, okay. to play now. Mm. Um, so where did, it, where, did it step, where did it go to from there? So I played, we were playing on Sundays then. Okay. So um, Is that Saturday a good thing or a bad thing? No, oh, in a way it was a bad thing because I had no rest because Saturday I was working the markets. Right. So I worked Monday to Full Friday on. and then markets on the Saturday and play on the Sunday and then back to work again. Wow. So, um, yeah, if I think about it. But um, when I left packing table, I was a postie. Okay. So I sort of switched it. I thought, you know, I saw some girls in rugby and I said, and they were biking and I was like, man, they're fit. And they said, oh, yeah, go be a postie. But you work Monday to Saturday. Right. And I was like, oh, that's all right. Like, I can try. So I went to an interview and they see, oh, sorting mail. And they're like, oh, no, that's, you're good. So go to the next interview. The next interview is riding a bike. Yeah. I've never ridden a bike. Oh. So I've, I've sort of played around on my next door neighbor's bike, but we never had bikes when we were little. Like, yeah. um, our family, we never got, you know, we yeah. never bought bikes. So, so we could went. you ride a bike? I did then. You learned then. <laughs> I sort of, because I'm my next door neighbor, I used to go now and then, you'd have to sit on yeah. the head, of, is it a 10 speed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back then, yeah, and yeah. so they had that frame the that you could sit on. Top. So you can just yeah. um, go and muck around. So I had a little balance, bit. You could already balance and everything. Yeah, so okay. I could. But then when they told me to go and 
the, the posted bike had this sort of frame in the front. Okay. So I found it weird that the bike was turning, but the frame was staying. Oh, right. So right. we just had to go around, and then the lady was, oh, no, that's that's good. And I was like, thank goodness she didn't tell me to drive down to, like, ride down to the street. <laughs> but then I sort of just learned as I was going, like, with mail, because you have to sort of balance yourself and put the mail in. Yeah. So that was my next job after um, Pack and Save. They kept so you fit? They kept me fit. Yeah. But then I knew that I didn't ride a bike on the rugby field. I have right. to still run. Yeah, so okay. I still train. So it's not like you're going to ride your bike around the rugby field. That's right. You've got to get off and um, run. Yeah. So, but that kept my, that picked my fitness up. Yeah. Because I was, I enjoyed food. Yeah. I was heavier back then than what I am now. So, sure. Mm, yeah. um, that's such a good thing that you brought that up because, yeah. yeah, so at what point do you start to make the, um, for me it was quite late, whereas, because mm. um, coming from Tonga, I never really knew about the food. Yeah. Like honestly, when I was growing up in Tonga, the, the most, the, the things I knew about fitness was that yeah. you either run or you lift heavy weights. Yeah. And when you eat, you eat heavy food mm. to like back it all up. That's it. That was the only education I had about food and fitness. Yeah. That's really bad. <laughs> that's really bad. <laughs> but like, that's what we know. I mean, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so when did you start to realize or when were you taught the education of like how food and fitness work together? I started... Um, Playing a few club games and then making a rep team. I am um, like, because then I was making Auckland. How old are you at this time? I was 19, 18, 19. So I was only playing club rugby for a little while and then there's some interest, you know, they noticed that, you know, you can play Auckland. So I went and tried and I played. Um, but at that time, I was still, um, I had to choose between netball and rugby because it was an uh, Auckland Union netball tour, uh, and for netball and then we had rugby storm. So I chose rugby. Um, Hard choice? No. Okay. Um, for me it wasn't because my mates were playing rugby and my dad was more suited on the side of the rugby field cheering me on then on the, at the mm. courts because he was the only man really at the courts cheering me on. <laughs> so I thought it would be quite interesting for him just to stay with rugby. So no, I loved rugby more. It wasn't a hard choice at all. Um, and then went in rugby, they have nutrition talks and right. you get um, called to a, um, a, a New Zealand development um, they saw potential in you up and coming New Zealand players. So you get caught to that. And in my head, I'm already like, you know, I'm, I'm going places, you know, I'm yeah. getting noticed. And so I started thinking, oh, I've got to eat right. You know, I was still yeah. loving um, drive throughs yeah. and, yeah. and yeah. full night ease where everything's on the table. It's like it's Christmas every once a week at home. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I just started training. And for us um, Pacific Islanders, especially females, we love to go gym and push some tin. Um, we were naturally powerful. Mm. But we hate running. Yep. You know, we hate the running. Sometimes we just don't see the purpose. Yeah. But you had to change your mentality because you're running on the rugby field. Yeah. You know, so that's when um, we started going to all these uh, little uh, nutrition talks and that. And then that's when I thought, no, nah, if I want to be a black fern, that's the mm. only way I'm going to get there is if I change everything. Yeah. Yeah. Because as a, I mean, as a black fern, on average, as a hooker. What are you running in the 40 minutes? Is it around 5K? Yeah. Yeah. yeah run about that. Yeah. Because yeah. you're, you're like the fourth flanker. Yeah. yeah. And um, you're running, getting hit, drop down, get up. It's yeah. not just running. It's, no. Yeah. You're tackling. You, yeah. Like now, like back then, you used to be at the front of the, um, the line out and that little five channel that we used to enjoy because you're like, oh, this is my little breather. Rest. Or I should get caught into lift. But um, now they put them at halfback, so you have to shoot out the you're the first tackler. Right. But I enjoyed that. I loved that. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Because I love contact. And rugby was my like, contact and rugby was my favorite thing. Right. Mm. When did you discover that? Just when you first started it. When I first started, it, I was quite um, a little angry little player. Okay. Mm. I used to get in little fights and and yeah. Angry little player. Mm. Yeah. So as soon as you start playing. <laughs> You play from a point of emotion, or is it just a natural feistiness? I think it's a natural feistiness. It's a mixture, isn't it? Yeah. Like it's because you're competitive. Um, yeah, yeah. No, I'm not that competitive. Do you reckon? Did you know that you've punched me in the face twice? <laughs> when? <laughs> we had a um, a boxing class. Oh, you remember this? Briefly, I think I was in the zone. I say you are always in the zone. <laughs> See, this is the thing. Well, this is the thing when you switch on. Yeah. You switch on, but you let a couple of jabs get straight through, and I was like, I was pleasantly surprised. <laughs> no, because like um, it's it's. I think it's great. Mm. I think more Pacific Island women shouldn't be afraid of yeah. their um of their natural competitiveness. Yeah. And should bring it out, man. Like that's something to be so celebrated that shouldn't be suppressed yeah. as like a non-feminine thing. 
You know what I mean? Because so, so many of our Pacific Island women, that's strong, man, and that beast. I've seen yeah. some ladies just walk into the gym and never do an exercise and then straight away lift like yeah. 80 kgs or something. Wow. And I'm sitting there like, wow. Yeah. You know, natural, na- raw That's talent. natural ability. Yeah. No, but I, once I get on the field, I just... Yeah, it's that switch. I mean, in Black Ferns, once you do the haka, it's, 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 on. It's, it's on. And that's the switch? That's the switch for me. Right. National anthem, you cry. Yeah. You yeah, get teary, you think about your family back home and that kind of stuff. And as soon as it gets the haka, it's, uh, for, us, for me, it's, it's on. Like, if I see someone smirking while we're doing our haka, yeah. I'm going to look for you on the field. Sure. Yeah, that, that's just my... Oh, no, I get that. Yeah. I understand. I understand and what you're saying. Yeah, so it's either you have that mentality, you, you kill or, get, or be killed. Yeah. Yeah. So, and plus you're in that environment as well. Mm, yeah. And it is, at the, especially when you're playing Black Ferns, you're at a high level mm. where um, it's look, it's dangerous, man. It's yeah. real dangerous because um, people have come so far and everyone's on their own personal journey yeah. and they are there to win. No one's there yeah. to lose. No, no. I think sometimes <laughs> in a way that it's probably one of the hardest um, games that you know where, you know where there's some different games where people can um, cheat and like um, throw a game mm. or something. I think rugby... Rugby union is probably the hardest one where you could try and throw a game. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, what you like mean? if you if you secretly made like a bet with some big company for a lot of money that the Black yeah. Ferns would lose you'd lose yeah. this game. You couldn't do it because there's too many people involved. Yeah, too many people and there's so, so much going on. Yeah, like and the person that controls the game is the ref. Yeah. So unless he's in unless on he's it, in on it, yeah, yeah true, then um, yeah. maybe. But yeah. Um, yeah, as you see, there's too much, too many people, too much going on. Yeah. Mm. Um, so once you started to make this decision about rugby, mm. where did you get your first rugby check from? Rugby check? Mm. When you first got paid for playing a game of oh, rugby. That wasn't until Black Ferns. Wow. Um, and that was 2002. Mm. I made the Black Ferns. Um, I was 21. And my first time going overseas. This is, um, so I've got on my passport. Yeah. And I'm not going just to Australia or somewhere. I'm going to Spain. Okay. And so I've never experienced like a massive trip like that before. Yeah. Um, I'm leaving my family and never knew what jet lag was. Yes. Um, until, you know, my coach starts mocking. Because, you know, I'm still fresh and I I've, haven't been in New Zealand too long. Yeah. So, well, if you think about it. But, you know, we speak Samoan and they're all at home and then yeah, you're you've still been kept, in kept in tight in your community. Yeah. So my first time out and, you know, we're standing in the lift and my coach goes to me, have you ever been to Europe before? <laughs> and I'm like, nah, I haven't been to Europe. But we're in the um, UK. So I didn't know that Europe was this big up <laughs> place. Yeah. Um, so, and I'm sure I'm not the only one. Yeah. Um, but, and then I'm standing there and I'm like swaying. And I'm like, what is this? Like, oh. I'm quite lightheaded. And so, and they said, oh, you're jet lag. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so this is all, I'm getting all this. And then they. Um, they thought you'd been drinking. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't have known. I thought someone spiked my drink or something. Like, <laughs> but I had lost a lot of weight though, because so I was thinking it's from that. Right. Because um, oh, yeah. we were on a raw, strict, strict diet. diet um, and I was training more than probably anyone else because, um, I wasn't getting game time, so if you don't get game time, you're doing extras. Right. And so, um, yeah, it was quite intense. First time being jet lagged. First time being jet lagged because first time in Europe. Yeah. <laughs> and first first stamp on your passport. Yeah. Yeah, it's massive. Like, who would have thought I would be in heading to Spain? Mm. Stuff that you see on TV. Mm. Like, if it wasn't for making Black Friends in 2002, I wouldn't have experienced that. Yeah. And then you get your paycheck when you come home. So I don't get paid when before. We don't get paid before we went. So, yeah. Okay, so obviously the feeding and stuff, you feeding you over Everything's there. Everything's free. Stuff, yeah. But what if you got like a mortgage or rent back home? Um, I think the girls, they were getting paid from, it was their job. So taking leave from their work. So the, um, we don't get paid until we came back home. Before you made the Black Ferns, were you playing for Auckland? Yes. Okay. So it was. We weren't getting paid for it. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you about this. Is there like a real, um, is women's rugby really behind behind men's rugby in terms of like how they look after players and, and paying them and stuff? Yeah. Obviously back then, because this is back in the 90s, right? 2000s. Yeah. This is yeah, in the 2000s. Like, this is, um, yeah, 2000s. Okay. Like even now for even Auckland, now. you don't get paid. You don't get paid for Auckland, you don't get paid for club. You get paid for your national team. 
Um, so uh, a lot of... It's what, pretty ridiculous, eh? <laughs> Considering yeah. as well the, the amount of stuff that the Black Ferns have achieved mm. in their time yep. as well. It's pretty... So they're still quite far behind. Yeah, the girls, the girls are getting contracted now for Black Ferns. Yeah. Um, and that kicked off in 2018. Right. But before that, we were getting paid if we go on tour. Um, um, Auckland, no. Oh. Sorry, and the club, no. So those are your stepping stones to your paying um, to Black Ferns. When they're paying and when they're playing in the Black Ferns, yeah, is it? Are you getting paid enough to not have to have another job? No, you still have to maintain a. This so ridiculous. I still maintain a full time job, but it, it just makes the girls work so much harder. Uh, and appreciate makes them appreciate it more, um, right? The, like the, because if they were just like pussy for me, if I was just playing rugby, I wouldn't be working extra hard, right? Um, just trying to balance everything and just that work ethic again. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So if you're in the black ferns, and you still have to have a job, am I right in saying that it's still considered then an amateur sport? Yeah, it is. See, I didn't know this. This is great. I don't know this. Yeah, but they. What's it yeah. like for other countries? I think UK. UK is just picked up now. Right. Yeah, the 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 ball game with rugby, with women's rugby is still behind, way behind the men, and yeah, but it's picked up massively from when I first joined. Okay. And the girls before me, um, they used to wear men's jerseys on the Sunday that haven't been washed. Um, when they played on the Saturday. This is just getting embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, when I came into the team playing um, club rugby, we used to wear real big jerseys, but they were washed. So I was fortunate to not be wearing someone's um, dirty shirt from the day before. So, but we used to wear shirts down to our knees um, and run around with the shorts that go up to your hips. Mm. My first rugby boots were from another lady on the team. Okay. Yeah. So. It's like kind of talking about like rugby in the islands. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? When like, I first this started. Is, yeah, yeah. This <laughs> yeah. is what it's like for rugby in the islands. But we're in New Zealand, which is mm. like one of the best rugby countries in the world, if yeah. not the best. But if you think about it back then, it's women like men. Like they always say it's a men's sport. Back then, like when we were first coming through, only like men were playing it, and the females were just playing. I don't know what they were calling us because. You were still weren't named Black Ferns. But, oh no, we were, when I made the team in 2002, we were called Black Friends. Right. But like, m me thinking is like, when guys see, when girls. guys watch a game of Black Friends, right, and they come and s they chat with me about it, they're like, man, you girls play like, you know, great. You guys, the way you, your skill level, um, you know, your phases, are perfect, you know. And I'm looking, and it's just like, like real players. Yeah, but I'm like <laughs> looking at them like, and then I, if you have watched us 10 years ago, you'll say the same thing. It's like, the, where have you, I feel like saying, where have you been yeah, there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, um, it's like they're blind to the fact that we played the same yeah. as what the guys play. Yeah. So we hit the same. Um, we sure run the do. same. Yeah. And it's not like we have a different rule book, like females rugby, this is what you do. And men's rugby, this is what you do. So when I talk to guys and they come up and they talk about that, I just, I smile I'm, as, you know, you can't be mean. But, but in my head, I'm like, where the arrogant. F have you been? Yeah. Like, you know, how can you say that? Yeah. Because this has been going on for the last 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think, though, it's slowly changing? I'm really hoping you're going to say yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I do. I do see that it's changing. I mean, the girls are getting more um, views on, like, on TV. Like, they're on Sky Sport, TV One. Um, back then, we used to make the newspaper... If we won the World Cup, we used to be at the back of the newspaper. It was a headliner. That was massive for us. Now we're in the front of the newspaper if we win a championship. But, yeah. Like, there was so much talent in, in that back in the day that, that it was never um, told. Like, the stories of those girls, how they used to um, train or how they used to make the team. That was, that was never told. Mm. There'd be a lot of stories there. It, Good sure stories, and that's, mothers that's well. why I trained so hard because I watched how those girls trained. Like I came into the team yep, late in, in that 2002 period, but those, the girls that made it in 1998 and World Cup, man, they trained like beasts and 
all hours of the day and they were working full time. Some of them, yeah, they were mothers. Some of them were mothers. And they had to experience some smelly jerseys before some games before they played, so. That's just not right. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's changing, slowly, I mean, changing, um, but I wish it could be a lot better. And faster, faster change as yeah, well. faster change. Um, when you first get the call, do you get a call that you're a black friend? Yep. You get a phone call, like, mm. what is that like? Ooh, I still remember my call. Like how, mm, yeah. It was exciting, yeah. but I was, I couldn't really get a word on because I was crying hard out. We- yeah, I was crying hard. I, like I was just like, you know, when you're that ugly cry when you're trying to like, when your lips shaking. Like, so I was just thinking, but um, yeah, because what people, well, some people do know, but my dad had passed four months before that, or August, and I got the call. So he passed in two thousand one, and I um, made the team, got the early call in two thousand and two, right. to go to Spain, and so that made the black fin. So. Um, that sweet. was what I was thinking about. Like, you know, I was just like, you know, I did it. So I went straight to the cemetery. I drove straight, straight to the cemetery and told him I made it, finished off my cry there. And then, yeah, um, just, just to me when they're saying that, you're, congratulations, you're in the Black Friends, um, going to the World Cup in Spain for 2002. And I was like, yeah, I said thank you. But then that was pretty much it. I was like, <laughs> Your family must have been insane. Proud, yeah. yeah. My brother, my t- brother, I was really close with that. Played rugby. He was in the UK at the time, so that was another thing I was excited to. I get to see him. See him, mm. yeah. yeah. So, yeah. How that, old are you at this time? Sorry, you're twenty two. Twenty one. Twenty one. So, Dad passed away in August, and my twenty first was in September. Oh, I know. So everything. So oh. it just hit. So I cancelled. So he put on a big twenty first. I can't. I said, no, I don't want anything. And so um, he passed away and then, yep, 21 and then, but I was still playing. Um, but I was taking out all the emotions in rugby, like I was just getting on the field and just, you know. And that, and that was a period where everyone was having their 21st too, so you were, we were enjoying your drinks and, yeah. you know, I even went to some trainings drunk. Mm. Um, mm. It's just, that was life. Mm. Um, and I went through a dark period of dad passing away, but then I sort of, Switched. I thought, you know, this is what he wanted me to make the blackface. I trained. I was running more than I've ever ran before. I reached out to an um, ex black friend and asked her if she can train me with the running. So I went to Pamela Basin after I finished work. Um, so the running, would you do? So um, after I finished work on the bike, yeah. So being a postie, like we do, like thirty k's on the bike, um, delivering. Mm-hmm. Finish up there, then you go to. I meet her at um, the Pamela Basin about three o'clock. So I do two rounds of Pamela Basin, which is 3.2 Ks. Yeah, so 3.2 Ks, and you get your time, so half that for a rest, and then you go again. Um, and then from there, you go to your rugby training. And so you get home about 9.30 at night after your you rugby You do six point, f- you do, you, <laughs> well, you, you ride 30 K first, <laughs> you run 6.4 K, then you go to rugby training. Yeah, you go to rugby training. But you get to rugby training and then some girls are doing extras beforehand. You get there, you do your extras. Jump in with them as well. Yep, and you do your extras and then finish rugby training about 8.30. Mm. So you get home about 9.30. Because back then, you know, you didn't, you couldn't go back and forth because, you know, it wasn't cheap. Right. So you go from one right. place and it's just you you stay out there until um, you, everything's done yeah. and then start again the next day. Yeah. And that was the only way that I was going to get a black jersey is if I had to, I had to get fit. So I was told by the coaches that I had all the talent, and I had all the talent, but you need to get fit. And I knew that the girls that were up, I was up against were fit. Mm. Like, I was watching them run around. They can run around. But in my head, I'm like, you can run around, run around and do all that, but I'm going to get you at this and that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew yeah. that I had to get my fitness up. Yeah. And that's what I had to do. So a lot of competition to oh. nail that jersey. A lot of competition, yeah. And I, had to, I was competing against the captain. Okay. Yeah, at the time. Mm. Yeah, yeah. But, like, I knew that I was always going to be in that second spot, but I wanted to make sure that if I got my opportunity um, to shine, then I'll, I better be at my fittest or, yeah. and I better be switched on. See, that's such a mental thing when you're always on the back bench, mm. but you have to be in peak condition because yep. you never know when you can have to step straight on mm. and you have to perform yep. better if not even good if not even better than the other person. And yeah, I mean, and I appreciate, I, I honestly appreciated sitting on that bench. Mm. It was nerve wracking. Like I was 21 and I was sitting there at a World Cup and I was nervous as hell. Like 
everything. Bigger stadiums, so much more people. Big, big stadiums, but no people are watching us. Because <laughs> this is fem- this is women's rugby. This is women's rugby. They had to like, um, oh, I don't think, there wasn't much people at our um, at our first final. Right. Like a lot of it was the other teams watching us because the teams stay and watch. Right. Um, and then they have to move them all to sort of one side so if the camera sees them it's looks like it's packed the 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 skills of being on tv wow so but it was good it was an awesome experience yeah yeah. um and that my first world cup i probably got three minutes on the field okay Mm. and i lost a lot of which game was that against australia okay Mm. and whereabouts is this game this is in spain Ah uh, no, sorry. I mean, at what what stage of the World Cup is this? One of the pool games? Yeah, pool this, game. Okay, pool game. Yeah. Um, played. I think it was our second game. Yeah. Yeah, I got on the field. I, I wasn't expecting to get on the field at all at this World Cup. No, right. Being my first one, I just enjoying the um, experience. Um, I was shit scared of those girls. I mean, our girls, out of respect, you know, they were. They were something else. They were walk around, with, you know, shoulders back and. The girls on your team? My team. Yeah. So I looked up to them because they were so Dominant. shoulders back and Alpha. Yeah, they just they were a part they were champions. You know, we were um champions prior and so they were just like, you know, you walk in and it's like hush. And I felt great being part of that group that yeah. you know, everyone was just like quiet, they were walking in. Yeah. But um yeah, so much respect for those girls that yeah that, that before me. What was the team culture that you walked into? Like what was it like being amongst that? If I think about the team culture, it's oh, we celebrated when we need to celebrate it and we worked when we needed to work. We um, we all about like we had back then we had cards, yellow cards. So we all as a team said, Okay, if you do something wrong you gotta hand your card back in. Um, so yeah What does that mean? What's the yellow card signify? So a pledge. So you have you've pledged that you're gonna do not eat bad, um, do the extras and all that kind of stuff. So if you slip up, your card goes underneath the management door. So our aim was not to even hand your card in. So you've got to maintain that standard. And that was our pledge. Because we abide as a team that this is what we're going to do. And this is how we're going to win the World Cup. Yeah. Do and they so still have that? We have different um, That's stuff. a pretty cool um, system yeah, that to was, have. Yeah, that though, was good. Because it's um, self-accountable. Mm, yeah. We still have that, though. We, I mean... I'm not too sure about what the Blackfields do now, but when we were in it, uh, we used to have um, team um, meetings and that beforehand. Right. Where it's just a girls um, girls meeting. And we used to have standards. So this is what we're doing. This is what this is what's going to happen if you don't do it. You know. So everyone's accountable for the actions, and um, it's not about you. It's about the team. Yes. Mm. And when you first came in, though, was it quite a supportive environment for someone that's new, or is it still very competitive within the team for spots? When I first joined in, mm. it was quite um, competitive. Mm. Um, Still I'm quite this staunch. new young, I'm this young one coming through, and I didn't feel as if I was getting a lot of help, as in like skill wise and that, like fitness and that. Yep, everyone will be picking you up because if they don't pick you up, they'll be doing it too. So it's like, yeah. um, sorry, but sorry. now, um, yeah, we help, each player help each other, like. Yeah. Me being in my role as a as as the hooker, I was always helping our girls, sharing what I you know I, I know. I would never hold anything back because I know if what I share, um, I have to go and dig extra somewhere else to see what I need to improve on. Right. So if I share what I know and, and my skills, um, then I've got to think, oh, how am I going to improve my part wow. again? So that's just that's ticking on my head. So I'll teach them everything they know yeah. to perfect it, and then I'll go and loop. Like look, look for something else to improve my skills. Mm. Mm. Um, that's your first World Cup, um, and then you come back to New Zealand. And when you come back, because you guys won it, mm. and you come back. What it's like coming? Was it like coming back to New Zealand with the World Cup? It was. I, I was stoked. This is the year <clears throat> two thousand and two. Yes. Yeah. So I, because I was the youngest, and because well, the rookies, we have to look after the cup. So the whole time, so we're all holding the cup, but most of the, like the whole time back home. Um, tiring trip, because it's not like we have first class or anything. You're at the, um, wow. you're squashed up and you've got fat feet and, and everything. And um, 
one thing that we did appreciate is on the tr- on the flights is if we have a back row to ourselves. Right. If there's if you look around and there's a seat with like three empty, you go and lie on it. Stretch out. But um, yeah, we all saw like exciting to come home with the World Cup, but we just couldn't wait to go home and Rest. have a shower because you're on a flight for like thirty six hours, and like it's not like we're going into a Kuru lounge to go have a shower because <laughs> you know that wasn't given to us. So right. Mm. Humble beginnings, eh? I'm sure like it's. It's it's gonna change. It should change. I think it should change mm. drastically, because um, it just doesn't seem fair to me. Yeah. But well, you've obviously um, been in amongst it for so many years. Yeah. And just used to it. I've I've just appreciated because I'm coming from a kid from Samoa. Mm. You know, um, selling fish and fruits on the road, um, at the market, selling whatever we have. Um, excited with mum brings home a big pink bag or jumbo um, from the jumbo shop, jumbo sale, you know. So I'm, I've just appreciated mm. anything that was given to me. So mm. if I was getting made up to black friends and I was going overseas and sitting at the back of the plane. That's fine. That was, I, I was all right with it. Mm. Like in my eyes, I mean, that's, that's a lot for me. Mm. Um, and yeah, and I was going on a free trip, but like I wasn't paying for it. Mm. Like if I look at it now... Um, but obviously you'd hear from like you know the other players that are oh, born and raised here yep. within the team they must have complained about it quite a lot there's a lot of yeah. a lot of it yeah. and as a leader you do address the issue you do address the issue with and and I don't think it's right yeah, like yeah, yeah. if I put it up against the male stuff and that but I guess it was all right all right for, for me because that's yeah. I was um if I go back home like I love going back to Samoa if when I go back home and I see the little shack that we stayed in and how far my mum had to walk from the shack to the markets with the fruit with my brothers and that. I think, wow, I'm living luxury, luxury in New Zealand. Yeah. Like, this is nothing compared to what they had to go through. Mm. So, you know, I could still be the little kid selling fish on the road over there with snotty nose, um, walking around with hardly no soles on my sandals. But I'm here. Yeah, I talked about the same thing with uh, Bun oh, okay. yeah. uh, last week as well. And he said the same thing. He mm. could be the kid back in Cambodia that's selling stuff on the side of the street if his parents had never made the decision yeah. to leave yep. and that's such a massive decision for parents to make mm. as well hard for me to even comprehend that and I'm a parent myself yeah. to like pick up and leave to another country yeah. but um, yeah I guess we really appreciate it when we look back and see stories like yourself yeah I mean yeah I, it always brings a tear to my eye when mm. I think about it it's very humbling yeah because if I, whenever I see my brothers and sisters now, my older ones, and they were still working hard out, mm. I always think, man, if it wasn't for you guys, I wouldn't be mm. um, where I'm at today. Mm. So that's why when they celebrate things, I'm really, I always get teary when I talk about my family. Mm. Mm. Because when they celebrate things, I'm just like, man, why are we celebrating my achievement when this is all because of you guys? Mm. And it's a lot of money they put into it. And I know that they don't have much money, but they're such, if you know my family, they're such a giving family. And it's mum always says, you know, it's better to give. And never, you always give, 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 never expect, Don't expect anything to return. receive. Yeah. Yeah. And that's just how it is. Well, yeah. to me, that's the way yeah. the world turns. Yep. Like, if we don't give, then there's no real point in, yeah. like, sort of being around. Because I know there are a lot of people that are a lot of takers in this world. Yeah. But um, it's very important to give. Um, coming back to New Zealand. Yeah. And you are already, I guess, well, you're still a newbie in the Black Ferns. Mm. Um, but once you're in, are you in or is there still competition? They still come to yeah. you. You're, you're never, never. Um, On your laurels. Yeah, like a lot of girls, once they make the black thing, they think, yep, yeah, that's it for me. I'm a black friend. Nah. It, it ticks around every year. You got to keep working hard. Got to earn it every yeah. year. Yes, once you're a black friend, you'll always be a black friend. You, you, that's that's yeah. a saying. But there's a difference between being a black friend, always being a black friend, and one being one every year. So you're pretty much a, uh, a caretaker of that jersey for that period. And you've got to work your butt off to earn and that again. jersey again. Every year. Every year. And that starts from club. Like, um, I know that now that some girls don't go back and play club, but I've, I've heard through that they don't play club. You've got to go back and play club. Yeah. Because club is your first – because when you talk about the black jersey, mm. I say it, it's a black jersey, that, jersey that's got a lot of colours underneath it because the closest to your heart is your club jersey because that's what got you that first step. 
then you've got your provincial jersey, which is your Auckland jersey, and then the black jersey is the outside jersey because that's what you've given you a stepping stone to that jersey you've earned. Mm. How many years were you a black fan for? 2002 to 2018. Uh, 12, 16 years. Mm. It was, it's a lot of time. Yeah. To earn it every year. You have to. Yeah. Yeah. You can't take it for granted. And mm. Any of those years you felt like you were going to, it was beyond your grasp, like you might just not get selected this year? No, you'll nev- never have that thought in your mind. I mean, I, I would say don't ever think, think like, like that. that. At all, even if you've come out from an injury, like I've had injuries, but that just makes you train your butt off even more, because mm. um, you know that okay, this is what's you sort of know the plan ahead of what um, the Black Friends or what your team is going to go through for that year. Mm. So, so you set yourself little goals, yeah, little goals to make ahead. it, yeah. yeah. And you, you got to have that mentality that every game is you play every game like it's your last. So even if you're in club game, you're not going for an easy ride just to play club. I don't care who, if the person's just played um, their first game or second game, you're still going to go play every game like it's your last because that's the mentality you should have in every game. Mm. So I'm always going hard out every game. That's just Yeah, like what's that is. like if you're just coming back from like an injury? I don't think about it. Okay. I never think about injuries. Okay. Mm. Have you had many injuries across those 16 years? No. Okay. I've, my main one has been my knee. Yes. I did my knee um, in 2011 okay. at Twickenham. Um, I, uh, was that in much. a tackle? That happened on the field or did it? On this? the field. Um, so I was like 16, seven minutes, 17 minutes in the game. I yes. got tackled on the side. Yeah. Um, and I just felt it go and it was uh, my PCL, so my whole PCL um, ruptured. My PCL, Ouch. but it pulled the bone off the, I pulled a little bit of the bone. Right. But I stayed on that. I stayed on the tour. I didn't play any. I came off, but I stayed on and came home and I so no surgery. So I just you re- stayed on for the rest of the game. No, no. So I stayed on with the tour. But sure. I came. I came yeah. off. Yeah. Um, they brought a stretcher on. Yeah. And I was like, no way am I going on that stretcher. So I'm gonna walk off. So I walked off and um, went straight to and they said, oh look, you're done your knee. Um, lucky that I've got big quads that um, I didn't, it was a partial tear in my ACL, so I didn't need operation. Okay. So it was just rehab. Right. Mm. And that came right? Yeah, it was a few months out. Yeah, it came right. But that was my first major um, injury. Injury. Mm. It took me out the longest. What's it like getting injured? And what does it do to you um, mentally as well? Because obviously it must be really frustrating because you can't join in like the, the full trainings and stuff and you can't play properly. Yeah. So you're part of the team, but you're not in the way. It's frustrating. Yeah. Yeah, injuries are frustrating. Um, it puts you in dark places, yeah. does it? Yeah. yeah. Um, but then you've got to like, you, you, get, you get the frustrated side, but then you're thinking, okay, what can I do um, outside of my normal routine that I can improve, you know? So... Even though I had no knee, you still got an upper body, so you can go do stuff. Uh, you know, um, do arms, you know, um, sit on a Swiss ball and still through your throwing. Because you know, hookers we throw, so uh, just strengthen it. Yeah, yeah, and it's stuff that you don't really do when you know you're busy just um, training. Yeah. So yeah, I got to do that. Um, swimming was another one, I, but I hate swimming. I don't think a lot of people enjoy. A lot of Pacific Islanders enjoy swimming. It's a lot of work. It is a lot of work. Um, even though we live surrounded by water, and that's what I get, that's a question I get from people all the time. What is it? Is that, how come the Islanders don't swim when you guys are surrounded by water? And <sighs> I said, because we're, we're not going to exercise, we're going to get fish, and we're all you got to do yeah. <laughs> is up to you. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, there's a reef. We don't go beyond that. That's another arrogant question. <laughs> no, I get that. No, it's not arrogant, it's ignorant. It's like... Uh, okay, because one thing we don't, we're not going to the Olympics yeah. to do swimming, and no. we're only going to get food. So <laughs> we only go in the water to get fish. Well, unless you're a diver, you know, and there's only a few of those, um, mm. there's only a few per village that will actually dive. Oh, I only dive if I can reach the bottom. <laughs> so, there's no way I'm going up beyond those reefs, no way. Yeah. Yeah. When I grew up in the islands, I was always dead scared of like, 
even going past the reef. I'd go to the reef, but mm. I don't know. There's always like the fear of the abyss and what's lurking. Exactly. In the like, deep what's the point? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, no. <laughs> um, across your years playing as a black fern, so you ended up going to five World Cups. Yeah. This is um, it's almost mind boggling. <laughs> Um, ended up going to five World Cups. Out of those five, you won four. Mm. Um, and you were captain for um, for how many? How many games as a black fern were you captain? Oh. Not sure. I do know that you were the first black fern to hit 50 caps. Yes. Which is amazing. Yeah. Um, but I started, I was a captain from 2012. So okay. six years. Okay. And I don't know how many games sure. there was um, during, during that time. Yeah. But lost the games and won games. So um, lost the World Cup and won the World Cup. So quite... Um, you, do you learn more from winning a World Cup or from losing a World Cup? Losing. Mm. And that, two, that 2014 period was like my worst year. Okay. Or that worst period that I, that I had. Okay. Yeah. So already like a World Cup tournament is quite intimidating because it's how many weeks? It's seven weeks long? Uh, we jam it down to like four. Four weeks, okay. So it's four weeks long. Because for us females, it's like you play a game, you get two days rest, three days, and then you play again. Oh, my God. So, it's, yeah, that's how our World Cup will go for two weeks, pretty much. Right. Two to two and a half weeks. It wasn't like um, like the men's one that it stretches out. Stretches out. No. So we'll get there like rest. probably four days before the tournament starts to sort of get used to the time and climate. Yeah, then we play a game. It's rough. It's the recovery time is not oh. the proper athlete recovery time. Nah. Especially when you're just going through like maybe 20, 30 car crashes in one game. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, that, and that's why like towards the end of my career, I basically couldn't walk after a game. Um, you know, you get to celebrate your wins, but you just sit there with a, a drink or something and you're just wanting to go home because you know yeah. that you've got to ice up and – that moment, it's not really sore, but when you wake up, you can't even move. But you know you got to go and do a, a recovery session. Right. <laughs> so it was quite full on. And the last whole cup, it was you play a game, and if you've played the 80 minutes, then you get your two days off. So my knee would, because I still had a bad knee, would swell up quite bad. And by the time the swelling went down, it was game day again. And so you just switch on, you're thinking, nah, it's all good. Um, I'm going to go out there and just smash, so... Pretty much how it was. Does your knee aspects. hurt when you're running? I had it strapped. Um, now it does. Right. But back then, when I was playing, I never thought about it. It was just when I look at it afterwards, and I just thought it was fat. But um, just so I the said adrenaline it. takes over. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> the adrenaline, and it takes over anything. Like if you get a hit, um, it's not the fact that you just got smashed. It was the fact that you better get back up because you know um, you don't want anyone to see you on the ground. Yeah. That yeah. it's that. Yeah. You get back up faster than you went back down, than you went down so. Right. Mm. Um, you said um that year was one of was your worst year. <clears throat> this yeah. is um 2014. 14. 14. Okay. Um talk me through this. Like why was it your worst year? Okay. Um So I just broke up on a relationship okay. in 2014. Yep. Um, and then I had tried to rush a detective exam um, okay. before that and failed by 2%. Failed by what? 2%. Um, <sighs> and then I – so I tried to rush it so I can go away to the World Cup, not worrying about a – You failed by 2%. Yeah, not worrying about it. Damn. And so um, went to the World Cup, came back and lost and being – and we lost the World Cup. And it wasn't just the fact that we lost the World Cup. It was we had the best stats, but we came away fifth. So, um, oh, yeah, I was in a dark place, like mm. everything. And no one knew about the breakup in our team leading into any of the games going um, before the World Cup. Um, my detective exam, so you have five modules that you had to sit, and this was the last, um, this was the sixth one, which covers all the five and you had to get 60% to go through to induction, your next step. So you 58. So I got 58, yeah. Um, and then I was like, brush it off, okay, we're going to go to the World Cup. Go to the World Cup, we lose that. So I would come back with like, you know, three black, <laughs> three black dots already. It's like, oh. Um, 
But when we came back, um, the police were going over to Samoa to, for the SIDS. Um, and so I was going with them. SIDS, which is? Um, the Small Development um, Islands meeting. There was okay. a big, um, they had it held in Samoa. So we were going over as um, New Zealand officers, but getting sworn in as Samoan officers to help them out. Right. So we were there for 10 days. And that was probably the best um, thing out of the whole just year. Just to get away. Get, get away from it. Because then once I came back, um, I sat that exam again. Um, I got accepted to induction for detective. I just started training, training hard again. And I, my mindset was, because I was supposed to give up in 2014 for that World Cup. After that World Cup, you know, I thought that was it. You were supposed to give up? The playing, bl- yeah. Playing. You, and, you, this is a choice that you made? Yeah. Because, so if I go back, so I'll go yeah, back to yeah. when I was going to retire. I was going to retire in 2010. Okay. Why, yeah. why is this? Why did you make this decision? Because I was in a relationship at the time. Okay. Yeah, I was in a relationship at the time and I thought, you know, it's time to give up and, um, you know, start, you know, work on that. And I've just started with the police in 2010. How old are you at this time? So I was still 26. No, okay. I don't know. Um, hang on a second. <laughs> still, um, I was 20. Late 20s. Yes, 28. 29. Okay. Yes, I was around about then, yeah. It's a big decision to make. Yeah, because... Because you're almost like a... Aren't you, don't you feel like you're almost at the peak of your plane? See, I just thought... Oh, I'm thinking about fe- mm. this males, but yeah, and females, but I'm thinking about children and, fa- sure. you know, and that yes. family and yeah. that kind of stuff. Okay. So 2010, I had got him because I've ticked off my career because I said to myself, I'm going to tick off my career by the, before I'm 30. And so I was like, yeah, I'm a police officer now. So I graduated. And that was a tough time, 2010, because I had just finished, graduated from police college and gone straight to World Cup. And so, um, right. but that was a good period because you got to graduate, yep, tick, and then winning a World Cup, awesome. Yeah. And then coming back, I thought I'd finish on a high so and start you know, moving forward with my relationship. Right. But then the coach at the time said, oh, a lot of the older players are going. We need you, Fee. Yeah, so they wanted me to stay back just to bring the young through. And I thought, and me thinking, okay, um, I care about the young. I care about people coming through. So I thought, yep. You see how different that is, what you just said now, to how it was when you came through? Yeah. But do you see that's how a culture evolves, though? Yeah. You know, but that's great. Yeah, so, because yeah. I saw how, I mean, I felt real bad coming through, you know, just being like yeah. an outsider sort of thing, just watching and learning. But I wanted to give back to these young people. So, yeah, help them through. And that led us to that 2014 World Cup. Things weren't going well in my relationship. Um, mm. well, obviously, I've gone back and played. And so by 2014, that was over. And I lost the World Cup and then um, failed my exam. Mm. But When you're in that dark place... Um you're probably early 30s now, I think. But when you're in that dark place, um, I don't want you to go back there, mm. but um, try and talk to me like um, what it's like to be there yep. and your process of coming out of it. It was... You just want a time on your own. Like, it, you kind of just didn't want to see anybody. But for me, it was real difficult. Like, that's what I wanted, but it was real hard the situation I was in because I wasn't telling people okay. and I wasn't telling people and I wasn't I was still keeping this front because I knew that I was leading a team um, you know I'm this police officer I'm supposed to be strong and almighty and you know and save and I mean serve the, our country and, and protect everybody so that's what I thought so like. you're holding up a persona in front yeah, yeah. yeah. and so I just it, so it's hard to hold that persona it's hard. And you're not talking um, to anyone about this? No. Mm. Like, only tell my good mates in rugby knew about it. Okay. But it's not like you have the time just to, you know, you always, um, I'm in meetings and that kind of stuff, but we went and had a coffee or, or hot chocolate at night one time. But you never, me being that person, that I'm, I'm not going to say everything. Like, I'll just say the Some main stuff. But, yeah. But then... Um, my mum always told me, like, and this this is one thing that sort of is like praying. Like, you, you talk to God and talk to God on your own. And I'm guilty of this because I should be doing it more even on my good times. But I tend to try and talk more to him when I'm in trouble. In trouble. And I, 
And that's something I'm not happy with myself with because I should be talking to him when things are great as well. Mm. But so she's always said, um, always pray. Mm. So, you know, I was, that was one thing that, that sort of helped me as well. Right. Mm. Are you quite religious? Um, were you always raised quite sh- strong religiously? Yeah, we always went to church every Sunday. Catholic? Time. Catholic, yeah. 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 Always went, um, yeah. Well, we were in Sunday school at a, when we were quite young. Mm. But I think mum and dad sort of decided, because they did that a lot in Samoa. Mm. They were heavily involved in the church in Samoa. Mm. But I think, I don't know what made them just say, oh, we'll just go Sundays. It's probably because they knew that if things had to change in New Zealand, we can't keep keep some stuff from Samoa. Um, How often would they go in Samoa? But if mum was Every heavily day. with um, with the Sunday school, oh, so right, she's a right, Sunday school right. teacher, yes. and that and dad was part of the committee, so right. they're quite involved. And here we were just, um, you know, just go on as a family on Sunday. Mm. We're involved in the Samoan community, yeah. So you found praying like a way for you to sort of come out of that. Yeah, yeah. Looking back at that from where you are now, mm. is there anything that you would do differently at, where, at that particular period? No. Okay. No. Okay. Like, if I look, yeah, it's, I wish I never went through it. Sh- but, sure. Um, Everybody but, wishes that. Yeah. But I'm glad I, I did. Well, in some ways it, it would have made you it made the me person strong. that you are today. Yeah. I'm quite strong headed now. Yeah. Um, because of it. Yeah, because of it. Um, but then one thing that, that's a negative out of it is that I fear getting into relationships. So, okay. Yeah. So that's that's probably like a, a sad side of it. Of yeah. It, of yeah. It. Just trying to get into that trust or earning trust again. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm. I wouldn't change it. Like, yeah. um, as they say, you you make a decision, you go with it, and you, mm. you learn from it. Sort of thing. It's important that everything that you're saying and that I'm asking you about, because mm. there's people out there listening to this, yeah. you know, they have to understand that not everyone is strong. Yeah. And uh, there are a lot of people that appear strong and stuff mm. and that are around us all the time, yeah. but we yeah. never know what they're going through. No. no. Um, if you were to go through something now, do you have different ways that you did, you'd deal with it? Um... I will go and um, I'm just trying to think whether I don't want to say something that I know that that I won't do. Like right. um, yeah, yeah. I'll say I'll go talk to people, but yeah. I'll probably call, yeah that that like we have counselors available. This is at your work as a detective. At my work yes. as a detective because I look, you know, we. But some I quite I'm a quite I'm a private person, right. and some other stuff that I do want to talk about, mm. I don't want to tell anyone, you know. Right. So my way of doing it now. Why, uh, can I ask why? Like, does that make I you feel, does that make you feel smaller if you talk about it? I just, I think it's more, I feel, I, I don't want pity. Like right. I don't, you know, I still want, I, it's hard to sort of um, say. It's I've, hard to ask for help. Do you find it hard to ask for, for help? For me, it is. It's hard for a lot of islanders to ask for help. Because I, 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 I'm usually the one helping. Right. So I'm always the person that people contact. Like I have friends that ring me or message me to say, look, I'm going through this. Can you talk to me? So I'm the one giving the advice. So, and I'm, yeah, I know. I find it hard to ask for help. I don't, and even though it's so easy. It's not. It's not. It's not. And so you. Um, I have had so many people sit where you're sitting right yeah. now say the exact same thing. Yeah. As much as we talk about asking for help and stuff, it's one of the hardest things. Yeah. Uh, for me, uh, it's one of the hardest things. To put this podcast together, I needed help. There's a lot of stuff here I don't know. Yeah. I can't figure out myself. I've never done before. Mm. One of the hardest things was asking some of my closest friends who specialize in stuff like this, yeah. ask them for help, for their advice. I don't like asking for help. Yeah. I have to do stuff myself. I don't like also the feeling of owing someone a favor. Yeah. I don't like that. I don't like feeling like I've been vulnerable in front of someone else. Yeah. I don't like that. Because, I don't know, maybe just as a male, I like to be, I'm always quite sure of myself and mm. sure of what I do. And I like to keep it like that. Yeah. But I've learned so much about this, like asking for help. Um, yeah. And I've had a lot of friends around me as well that have gone through like really dark stuff mm. that I wish I had known about, yeah. but they never asked for help. You know what I mean? And... So yeah, that's why I ask you about it because yeah. um, our Pacific Island community, like we value and we treasure them. We value our family members as well and we treasure them. Mm. But sometimes they go through things that 
you think they'll talk to you about, but they, they wouldn't because yeah. they just don't want to. You know? And that's, yeah, like I remember... It's ingrained, like, do you think, in us as a people? It is, like, I've, I've just had this... Like, my, my, one of my close sisters, who's close in, in age, she broke down. Um, like, my last birthday, I'm not even going to say the age, but my big um, birthday that I had, it's like, she just says, I don't talk to her about anything. Like, there's, you know, there's stuff that I'll go through, that she'll hear from, from someone. I'm just so not used to talking to my sisters, um, even though I love them to death and that. We just never really shared so much like that. Um, I don't know if it's just from the... Like the because um, just like how our parents, we don't really tell them I love you. It's it's like feels I, weird. It feels weird. Like mm. we don't say I love you. you know, we just yeah, just because them on check and, and that like it's never it's never really been said. Like we just mm. know that 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 love's there. So with my sister broke down because I don't share anything with her. Like she's heard something that from one of my good mates that I'm going through, and she just like why don't you share? Why well, you should just open up? But that's just I have always been. Mm. Um, yeah. So, but then if you think about it, vice versa, like if she was going through something, and she I'll was, be like, how here. Would you, you know, like exactly. how would you feel? You know, I, it's, and I totally understand from that yeah. side because I give a lot of advice. I give a lot of advice to my friends, and, that, and I, I try and follow those advice myself. Mm. But then there's stuff that I just keep to myself as well. Mm. Mm. Um, I'm also going to ask: um, Do black ferns do they have like a sports psychologist as part of the team, or they, when you were playing? Oh, I'm just no. No, we had um, that people can't come visit us, but no, they don't. I know, I know that they have. No, they don't come on. We have a doctor. Is that a um, physical like? No, a just part of. Um, we have a physio and a doctor that will come on tour of us, but not a psych person or right. anything like that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> the stuff's so interesting. Yeah, um, I mean, we. I don't know about now, but yeah. um, yeah. It's, it is changing, mm. but as we said, just not fast enough. Mm. Um, okay, your um, rugby career is amazing. Mm. Okay, I want to talk to you a little bit now about um, joining the police force. Okay. And where did that come from? Um, out of all the careers in front of you mm. that you could choose from, why was it the police? I, uh, it's always been the police. It's always been the police. Always been the police. Always been the police. Um, you know, when I left school to work full time, I wanted to be. I always wanted to be a police officer. Right. But it was just when the when the when was the timing right for me? That's um, pretty much the question. Um, so I loved watching Crime Watch when I was little. <laughs> I used to watch it with Dad, and I okay. used to love watching Police Academy. The American one. Yeah, the American one. You watch all the because they got like. Like seven, seven eight. yeah, <laughs> yep. So we'll watch Mahoney, it. yeah, Mahoney, um, the High Tower. Um, what's the other one's name? Like, me, me, me. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. So I used I, to watch that back in Tonga. Yeah. yeah. So I love watching that stuff. <laughs> that was that really. That was the reason why I wanted to join. I thought, man, this is so cool. Oh my god. Yeah. Don't <laughs> don't say. It. And anyway, I was in, when I was seventeen. I thought, oh, well, I can go and try and be a cop because they had these pamphlets out at school, out of the college, mm. for police. But at the time, I was young. I was falling for a guy at the time. Mm. You know, it's high school sweetheart sort of thing. So I was like, oh, now I'll just go work. Because okay. it's going to take you away, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah, it wasn't until 2010 that I made the decision to to go. But that also... Okay, so from a good... How I get a good story is because I've gone through a bad story. Yes. Yep. So I, had, was, I went to Australia in 2000 and three, four, mm. um, and that was to be with the partner that I have been from school. Sure. So we went over there and stayed with his family. We broke up, so I came back home. How long were you there for? About two years. Yeah. How do you years. do that and still play for the Black Ferns? You fly back? So I, <laughs> so what I did was, in 2003, I played a season for the Black Ferns. The last, so I left at the end of 2003 after my season. And I took a 2004 off from the Black Friends. So I, I was going to live in Australia for good. I made this choice to go and be with this guy for wow. in Australia to leave rugby, not don't play anymore. Um, I think it's probably because of well, I was I was just training and I was sitting on the bench and even though I appreciate I wasn't getting the opportunity to play, so I was like, oh, that's enough playing. I've been playing sport for a while. So I went up to Australia. Still very young as well. Yeah. yeah. 
So we went to yeah. Australia and I thought, you know, we'll start, me and my partner being together for a while. But that fell apart um, and pretty hurt, like first time, um, broke, yeah. heartbroken. Especially <laughs> telling all your family that this is a yeah, this going, is a, yep. packing it's everything. It's embarrassing. And like to reach out to your mum again to say I'm coming home and she's mm. crying on the phone. My brother's in the UK, my tight one rings me from Australia, to, I mean, rings me from the UK and Australia. And I had no family, like I'm there in Australia, another country, this breakup's happening and I have to stay there for another two weeks until I get my final pay. So oh, I'm staying with my I'm ex's family. with his family. Yeah, and just trying to, keep, yeah, trying to keep the brave face and yeah. going through all this and just getting all your final stuff to bring back home again. Mm. No, so I come back home and it's 2005. Mm. And so I've taken that year off, 2004, and I wasn't going to play rugby again, but um, the best therapy for me at the time was the to just get on the field and just smash whatever's in front of you. you right. know? Yeah. So I was going through, I was drinking. Right. Um, I started smoking now, you know. Um, you, you know, things people go through, we yeah. go through. Yeah, 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 yeah people yeah, that don't realise. And so the Black Friends went away um, 2005 to a talk, so I just got to the beginning, 2005, they went away and they said, oh, do you want to come play club rugby? We've got a final for Marist. We need some players. So I was like, okay, well, I was fat and I was unfit. You know, I was working at Arnott's Biscuits, eating all the biscuits on the line in Australia because it's free. And so I was come back like high 80s um, in weight. And What's your playing weight that you're normally around? Um, 78, right. um, 82, about 83. Right. Yeah, right. ran right there. Okay. So I was high 80s. Came back and I started running again. And mm. I was thinking, man, you know, when you're on the field and you're like, man, why am I doing this again? Mm. But um, I started to get the love of it. And then from that game was the final. And then they, I made Auckland. Right. Uh, I made Auckland. Um, but You're back on the path again. Yeah, right? pa- back on the path. You know, I'm ticking, I'm going up my steps again. But the other Auckland hooker was the hooker they took away for the Black Ferns. She had just come and joined. Um, Karina Stowers is her name She's one of my best friends now Okay So she came back um, And so She's supposed to be The starting Auckland hooker um, But we started You know um, Playing again And She was trying to teach me And I was trying to give her Some advice and stuff But she was one of those Stubborn ones That when she first met her She's just like Oh you know But um, <laughs> She was good That's how we became close mm. Then she started um, Taking some advice And she became An awesome player mm. But then me and her were battling with the with positions. Right. Yeah. So right. it was good. And then Black Friends at the end of 2005 um, were having another uh, tournament. And the um, Far Palmer, who was the ca- captain at the time, was having surgery, so she wasn't playing. So I that was my first start right. in the Black Jersey. Right. Um, as it was at 2005. So I worked hard um, knowing that, you know, I'm going to get a start. So I trained. And all that again. So, yeah, 2005 and then um, made the decision 2000 and made the decision to, um, sorry, to be a police officer. In 2005 as well? Yeah, so after 2005, because I'd yeah. come back from the breakup yeah. and because I couldn't join in 2017, um, I mean, so 2000, when I was 17 um, from school because right. I was in that relationship, I thought the best way to get back at this guy is be successful in being a police officer because that's what I wanted to do and he didn't want me to be a police officer at the time. Right. So why didn't he want you to be a police officer? I don't know. Okay. He yeah. just So that's why I worked at Pack and Save. You know, a Pack and Save person or a police officer? You know, oh, he, but okay. because I was young and I was about, you know, I'd fallen for this guy, yeah. I thought, you know, yeah, I won't be a police officer. So, so that, that's the reason why I went back to be a police officer is because I've always wanted to do it. I was told not, not to do it at that time. I broke up with him and I thought, that's it. Um, the best way to get back out of guys be successful, especially in something that he didn't want you to do. Man, I just want to say now to all our listeners, <laughs> if ever you're with someone that tells you that you shouldn't do something and it's something that you want to do, that is a sign of like a toxic relationship, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. Like you yeah. should always be supporting, giving your partner like 100%. Like yeah. if that's what they want to do, even if you don't agree with it, okay, yeah. give, it a, give it a try. Like it might be you, it might not be you, but at least you're there to support them. Yeah. Okay. So I went through that. So that was, and I was like, nah, I'm going to get back at the best ways to be successful. Mm. So made the breakfast 2005, 2006, 7, that's when I made the choice to go to a seminar. And um, I went to a seminar and they said, yep, uh, I looked at it. You had to learn how to swim. You have to do swimming. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, I can't swim. How far do you have to swim? I was uh, 50 metres. Two lengths of the pool. Yeah, two lengths. That's hard. 
Okay. That's intense. So. Um, How much swimming have you done at this time? How I don't know how to swim. Okay. I did none. So I went never, to the seminar. Never swam before. No, I've done. Don't I've been know how to stay afloat. No. Okay. Yep. So really. Yeah. Just walking races in school. Kingsford never taught us how to swim, so we just went to races and running races in the water. So, to this, I went to a seminar, ticked it off, and I was like, okay, I fit all these boxes, but I just don't know how to swim. Okay. So, I thought, nah. After the 2006, we had a tournament, mm. and they asked me if I wanted to go to the UK. That the, uh, the UK wanted me to come over to this club named Bladen um, and play over there. Okay. So, I was like, okay. Oh, that sounds such stupid. a crossroads, eh? Yes, yeah, like- so I was like, okay, this is an opportunity for an OE. Everyone talks about OE. And I'm like, what's an OE? It's an overseas experience. So yeah. I thought, okay, that usually costs like six grand or something to yeah. go and do for that and do that. So I was like, this is the best way to tick that bucket list. So Plus you're there making money. Yeah. So I'm getting paid to go over to the, and it wasn't New Zealand dollars, it was pounds and the pounds were quite high then. Mm. So I was like uh, three to uh, a dollar. So right. I was like, yeah. So I was like, okay, I'll take it. Yeah. So I went over there with three other girls and I was there for eight months. Okay. Um, eight months, good experience. Yeah. They asked me to stay on, I said no. Yeah. So I came back in 2000 and end of 2007, mm. 2008. And that's when I got a call back from the police. And they said, hey, you filled out a form with us. Uh, are you still wanting to be in the police? And I thought, far out, yep. Okay, yeah, I've got nothing, you know, I'm working, I came back and I started working um, part-time at my mate, casual at my mate's um, cafe, okay. making um, coffee that I've yeah. never made before, I just learnt. Yeah. And um, so I went there and I thought, okay, I've got Prime Minister scholarships that I can use for, if you make a World Cup, um, you get some Prime Minister scholarship for New Zealand to study. Okay. So I thought, it's been like 10 years since I haven't been to school, so I'm going to go take a night class. So I went to MIT. And I got I took English and maths because that's what you have to do for the tests for the police test, and just writing essays in that. Then I was running, trying to run and and do that, and then yeah, and then I started learning how to swim. What but, was it like your first lesson? Well, okay, I taught myself how to swim in a way like <laughs> you're gonna laugh. No. <laughs> um, so Mang, <laughs> so I'll ask my friends. So they they'll come along and they start teaching me the, the normal strokes and that. Um, and then I'll go to, it was a Saturday morning at Mangere Pools. They used to have the kids' pool, or close, or Papatoa. They have a kids' area where they have the pool. So I was yep. swimming the lane closest to them yep. and just eavesdropping Listen them on the, the instructor. instructor. Wow. And so I'll just like, okay. So I'll just be going every morning just to practice. And I guess if I was moving faster than I was the last time, then it's working. Wow. So then I started, then I moved jobs and I was working for a, a driving company in Ellisley. Um, Casual work from another mate that I met at the night class. Um, then I started going to the pools every morning before I start work there, and I used to go to work with red eyes yeah. in the morning. Yeah. Like I look stoned. I was thinking, what have you been up to? I look stoned. Like I turn up when I was really tired, and they're like, what have you been up to? So I just been into the pools, and they said, have you not heard of goggles? And I went, sorry, <laughs> I don't know that goggles was because it fogs up all the time, so I didn't know why people were using it. I thought it was people with bad eyes, so I was just. Um, so I went and bought me a pair. I went and bought me a pair of goggles. And Change your life. Oh, I went on with shiny eyes. It was like <laughs> fantastic. Um, but um, yeah, so I started just going every morning just to try and get better. Finally can go there and back. Right. And started getting my times. Um, yeah. Googled how to stay afloat. It Googled a, how to stay afloat. Like egg beater. Dog, dog paddle. Yeah, because you've got to um, tread water for like five minutes. Okay. The diving for the brook, I had no issues. Right. Because when you go to the sea... How far do you dive down? Oh, it's not far. It's um, yeah. maybe two metres. Yeah. It's not far. Because when we go out in the ocean, we have to go get those big muscles. Yeah. So we dive down to grab it. Yeah. So I'm, I was used to that. Like, okay. So it wasn't too bad. So that was the test for the police. Um, wow. So finally got my certificate and then ticked all the box, boxes. Um, went and set my run. Mm. Um I didn't pass the run first time. Um, how long do you have to run and what, and what time? So it's 2.4 meter, uh, 2.4 k's yeah. um, and you've got to get it under 11 minutes 50. Okay. So, yeah, 2.4, yeah, 11 minutes uh, 50 for females. And because I, oh, that was probably one of the most embarrassing moments, I had turned up in my black fern shorts and thought I was a black fern 
thought I was cool going to run and I didn't make it because I didn't know. What's the time? Oh, I was 12, I think, because I didn't know how hard you have to run. I was just yeah. like going with it because it was six, it ended up being six and a half laps. Right. So we don't. Did you try it beforehand? No. Not really. Yeah. So okay. I was just thinking, okay, you know, I had that mentality. It was stupid of me to think that. I got this. Yeah. yeah. So I turn up and then they pass and I'm like, oh, that's what I get for being this rude dude that just turns up and you're thinking of wearing black friends. So the worst thing is that I failed to run thinking that I'll get it because. That's what you do. Yeah. Yeah. But totally different training. Yeah. So I started going on the treadmill, running faster and faster because you just have to run fast. Yeah. So went back and then I. Um, Past that, past my run. Um, That's crazy. So all parts of this preparation just to take this exam, you had to pretty much almost self-teach. Yeah. Yeah. Because I hadn't gone to school. Like yeah. I had gone straight to work. Um, and just and you go couldn't to... swim. Mm. But before, I really wanted this, to. Yeah, before this, have you ever had like a fear of being in the water or being in the yeah. pools? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And that's the reason why I didn't, because when um, the Mang- have you been to the Mangiri pools? They yeah. used to have that big yeah. slide. Yeah. So when I was little... Um, I went down that big slide except for the small slide. I followed my cousin down. And so all I, the fear of being underwater, just the bubbles, because I was, and I had to pull, I got pulled up by someone because I hung on their shorts. So just that. Oh. Um, and so I had to get over that, just being in the. the traumatic. Yeah. And that, in the water of just the bubble sounds, because that's all I was going, when I remember when I was little. Mm. How do you feel now about water? I still hate it. Right. I still, still. I only learned how to swim for the police. Right. Can you mm. swim now? I just go and walk. Um, yeah. I would like to go back to swimming, but I feel like I'm going back to square one again because I haven't yeah. been doing it. So what do you like when you go to the beach? You just stay in water there? Yeah, I just stay in water. I don't like what's out there. I don't know what's in the ocean. So yeah. I know these fish in there, but I, I just, I don't, I don't if like, I don't touch I, the bottom of the ocean, I don't. Sometimes I won't even wear goggles out there. I don't <laughs> want to see what's, I don't want to see nothing. So I'm just like, no, nah, I'll, I'll be safe and just stay to the hip. Mm. So you got into the police. Mm. Now, getting into the police, what was your, did you have like a goal of being in the police? I know that you're someone that sets <laughs> goals. Or did you just want to be um, just a police officer? Yeah, so I wanted to pass all my exams first when I was in the police. Sure. Yeah. Um, but then, most of us, when we graduate, most of us Pacific Islands come out and we head in the same path. Like, um, Which is? Community work, work with the youth, um, schools. Uh, they, they were always in that, that sort of direction, which nothing wrong with it, but yeah. I wanted to do something different. Do something different. Mm. So there were no Pacific detectives, female detectives, like um, Samoan detectives. Right. And I was thinking... Why? Why? You know, I know I was none at why, all. There was none. There was like um, there was a Cook Island girl, a lady, um, Nuwayan. Yeah, there was, but there was no Samoan. But there's there, a few PI men though, eh? There were there yeah. were a few um, Samoan Pacific yeah. Um, males. Yeah. So I thought, you know what? Nah. Um, you know, we need more f- Pacific females in the job, mm. but we need more heading. You know, in directions where people think that we shouldn't be heading. Mm. So I thought, you know, I want to do this. Mm. Um, I didn't know how much study was involved in it, but right. I've already set my mind to it and I'm not going to backpedal or anything like that. So in 2014, uh, 13, not 14, sorry, I was about two, two years into my... Um, Being a police officer. Police officer, I decided I'm going to go down the investigation line. Um, I was told by one of the um, bosses, oh, if you want to go down to um, this other area, which is neighbourhood policing, um, you can get your strikes faster, you know, in that way. And I was like, I'm not about getting a position faster because going this, I want to do this. So, yeah, studied, um, heaps of study involved. And then I finally got accepted in the 2015 intake. Right. That was after I had failed my first um, right. exam before 2014. How many people did it take in? Um, how many people apply? Oh, so you, a few people will go through, um, but just when your time is right, they'll take you down. Um, and I went down to Wellington. Yeah. So all of this is happening between my um, yeah. rugby. Yeah. So. A lot of juggling. A lot of juggling. Um, so rug, I told rugby I'm going down to um, induction because we had a Canada tour. And the Canada tour was like probably three weeks away mm. after when I graduate. Mm. 
So when I was done in college, I was um, studying. We had to do uh, three exams in four weeks. Right. Um, and I was training for rugby. Had organised a car for me to go to Tower, which is the next suburb down to for nine to five with um, class for police, and then um, six to seven to train, and then come back, and then you got to study because you got three exams that you have to do. Damn. And that was in four weeks, so it was intense. Yeah. It was yeah. probably the worst part. You know, very tiring because not tiring. just um, not just like your training physically, but the uh, the studying and stuff it's is draining. Like draining, it's especially draining. for someone that doesn't normally do that sort yep. of stuff. And this I is, hate reading. And this is law. This is law. Yeah. This is like I might as well be a lawyer. I was like, I didn't sign up to be a lawyer, but as yeah. a detective, you've got to know all your your case law and everything. So it was intense. And mm. if you don't pass the first exam, yeah, which is eighty, which is sixty percent, you get sent home. So in my head, I'm thinking, I am not going to be the first time one female to come down in such a long time or forever I and fail. then get sent home. Because it's not, I'm just going to be like, oh, this is another. You know, 2014, I just got, overcame 2014 yeah. dark place. I don't yeah. want to be going to another dark yeah. place. So, yeah, I actually honestly thought I failed that first exam. I was just like, no. The second one or the first one. Oh, right, right, yeah. right. The second time you took yeah. it. Oh no, so the exam, because we have three exams done in college. Yeah. So the first one is that it's a formative, so you don't have to pass. Right. Yeah. The second one that you have to pass, but if you don't pass that, then you go home. Right. So I thought I had failed, failed that. that. And I was already like packing my bag, like I was like, this is not cool. And but you then passed that? I passed. <laughs> so excited. And how hard is the third one? It wasn't, well, the stress wasn't as bad, okay. but it was still hard. Like. Yeah. Just knowing every because you got to know everything word for word. Okay. Yeah. So that and that you is can't why do I'm like the rough idea or something. Yeah. And answer. that's why I was thankful for for rug, for sports and rugby. Why is that? Because that's how I learn my oh. um stuff. Word for word. Word for word. So how, what makes me tick is is um, in sport. So, with the police, you have a lot of word for word stuff. So you do acronyms. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So everyone comes up with acronyms and they, so they start off their sentence. I come up with moves. Okay. So okay. something was like, if uh, I'll be like, oh, front row hits eight, in, you know, so everything to start off. So I'll be like eight passes to ten, ten cuts or three, three goes down, um, blow, then wow. set up, kick the ball out. Like, so everything, that's how I would remember my acronyms is how I would do a move on the rugby field. Perfect. Then I thought, you know what? Put two and two together. I'm actually still playing rugby, but I'm enjoying it. And I'm sort of trying to educate myself. And this way, that's how I... And I think some kids like that just um, think... Um, get, Every, everyone thinks educates, differently. Yeah, educates yeah. himself that way. So, and I do that now. Like right. with um, stuff I learn, I always put it into a, a rugby sense. Right, right. Mm. So. so you became... And then you became detective then. Yes, yeah, so until you, be, you go into induction and you become a trainee detective. Okay. So you've passed your exam, yep. okay, so you've passed all your three intensive exams and you come back and you do 10 modules, which is 80% pass. So while you're working, you've still got to study um, oh, okay. exams um, and it's each like area, for example, you'll be studying um, serious crime. So they have a serious crime stuff. And then you've got um, arson or drugs. Mm. So 10, and then you after that 10, then you've got another three-hour exam that covers all of... Everything. Everything. Man, it's so, tiring just listening to it. <laughs> it's very um, very complicated. Very, yeah. very complicated. So, that's why when they say, um, when you have a... Um, you, detectives get so much respect in the job is because I've done so much study. Right. Yep. Um, so every detective I see, I'm just like, man, um, so much respect for what you've gone through because I, I know what, what they've gone through. Um, working full time and then finding the time to study, you need at least four weeks or to study one module. Yeah. And it has to be 80% pass. If you don't get that, you got to do it again and they give you a different exam. So it's like, wow. and then the final three hour one is 60%. But then you people take off two weeks off work mm. just to study for that. Just to study. That's insane. Yeah. New Zealand detectives are quite highly rated amongst in the world, aren't mm. they? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, are you the first Samoan female detective? No. We had no. Uh, another 
uh, female, Yvonne, but she's no longer in the job. Right. Um, finished well back here. So you're the second? Maybe. Right. I'm, yeah, not too sure, but... Have there been more PI these, f- females the, come through? Yeah. Right. So let me tell you, if I can do it, then there's no reason why you can't. A few girls have, um, are in the training and doing it, which is awesome to see. What was your first field that you were working in as, so, a, de- as a detective? I was working in the, at the Otahu station, at the CRB up there. Yeah, and good station to work out of. And then I moved to Adult Sexual Assault Team. Right. And um, then I moved to Crime Squad. Um, Crime Squad is like the det- Detective side of frontline, frontline policing. Okay. So you get to do the two, two, two shifts. So the two earlys, two lates, and two night shift. And I hadn't done a night shift in years. So Ouch. it's been like eight, eight years since I haven't done a night shift. Right. <laughs> so that was quite interesting. My first night shift. <laughs> and you, this is when you're still based in Otahu. No, I moved to Manukau. Manukau. Yeah. Okay. Manukau. So you have covered a few areas. Um, How long have you been a detective for now? You've been. Since 2015, which is been doing the work, which is... About five years. Five years. Yeah. yeah. You enjoy it? I do. Yeah. I do enjoy it. It's a pretty um, tough, um, tough career choice or tough <laughs> field that you're in. Mm. Um, it is. I'm, a, I'm with the child protection team at the moment. Child protection team. Mm. So you look after crimes that happen to children, is that right? Yes. And right. that's um, quite draining. Yes. Quite draining and... I can imagine. Yeah. But then it's quite, it's rewarding when you're there, to, when you can help and, and you can educate. Because a lot of it um, that I see is for far people, is education. Um, educating them before they come to New Zealand. In what way? Of how to look after their kids? On what, on what the law is, with the smacking law, um, that you can't live, leave kids at home at a, at a certain age by themselves. You know, stuff that you can get, can do in, in the island. Um, they need to know. Can't do it here. You can't do it here, or yeah. there is um, a penalty that comes with it if you do it here. Yeah. And how, what you know happens to that penalty. Mm. That, you know, so they need to be educated back home before they even come here. So that's something that. Um, that's not going to happen. Yeah, but that's something <laughs> that New Zealand can help with. Right. We can um, address that, or like go through our um, connections or our networks, maybe within the police as well. Yeah. Um, we've got liaison officers that work with the Pacific. You know, we need to start, you know, there's no point trying to educate them when they come here. They need to know before they come here what they're going to, you know, get themselves into. Yeah. Mm. Um, you said before it's quite draining and yeah. you must come across some um, pretty crazy cases mm. um, and some also that are probably, are probably hard to like, um, I'm guessing as a detective you have times where you have to um, put up like a wall yep. and separate yourself from what you can see in front of you mm. um, so it doesn't affect you yep. as much. How draining is that? Very. Yeah. Uh, it's very draining. So um, what do you use? Do you have tools of like stepping away from it mentally? You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, you know, I'm quite, yeah, before we're not with how I, how when I'm stressed out and I don't normally talk to people. Mm. It's hard to, so with me, this job, I just, it's, I, I can easily just put up a wall because I think about the victim and how and like what I've just if I've seen something really bad I just block it out straight away. I'm actually not am I right doing that blocking it out. Go deal with because I'm focused on you know the outcome of that. But I then, hate to ask this question. Yeah. What sort of give me like a rough indication of bad stuff that you do see? Like like deaths like just yeah just. I think the worst one would be a child death is the worst for me to see. Um, but just, yeah. But to me, it's it's normal now. I've, yeah, I've seen it, so, yeah, so I, I, I just put a wall up. Yeah. But how I get through it, I just go and train straight after. Um, you know, some people will go for a drink on that and have a chat. I just go and smash up some training because then I think, you know, I'm getting some gains out of it too <laughs> and it's the best way to release, to release that, that energy. That energy. Yeah. Um, and I tie myself up, so yeah. I, that's why when I was in the when I was in the police and when I was in the black friends, I was the fittest I've ever been. Right. Because I was like training, <laughs> training all, the all time. sorts of hours, um, not just to get me mentally and prepared for the next shift, but um, also for rugby. It was a great benefit. 
Mm. Um, and then I have that mentality if I'm not training, um, the other person is. So, mm. yeah. You've obviously achieved like a lot of things, mm. right? And I know you're quite humble about your achievements, which I appreciate. Yeah. Um, but um, like looking forward, what other things do you want to achieve? I definitely want to go higher and work. Right. Um, you know, leading a team is, right. is one that um, I would like to do. But just having a time away from leading a team, like with the black, being in rugby, I just wanted some time off to to enjoy our work without any exams or anything like that. So yeah. um, in the future, uh, leading a team, succeeding in, um, in my work. Um, there is something I do want to start up. Um, Business-wise. In the business life in the pipelines, like, um, in some, like in some more. Like yes. In, What's your idea? Well, we eventually I would like to buy the family business. What is your family business? Like my, my, like my uncle has a, a furniture place, a warehouse. In Samoa? In Samoa. Cool. Yeah. Makes furniture or imports furniture? Make, they, they make to the locals and make furniture and then sells it at the warehouse. So that would be a dream to... Um, that means you're living keep, in Samoa. Could um, possibly live in Samoa, go back and forth. Um, right. But if my mum moves back there, yeah. um, she'll have some income, a stable income to support her um, with that. Uh, but it's something I've got, you know, I still have to talk through and... Mm, figure out. Figure out. Because um, a dream would be to for people to come through that business... Um, mm and making furniture and then um, connecting with the education side of things and getting them to do the apprenticeship work through there, you know, long term. So this is like a bigger, so at least our people are getting That's a great idea. That's educated really giving back. Um, with our own way of um, making furniture and then um, selling it off to local hotels or, you know, working along that side. So we've got our own um, stuff within house mm. um, happening. But, That's great. Yeah. I would love to um, train. Um, I mean, at the moment, I shall I train my family in that, and I enjoy that. But opening up something like Kevin's got an awesome Fit60 gym going, um, maybe something in the island later on will be good too, but start with something small and then, you know, fret, um, branch out and to would bigger you, things. Would you take the classes? Would I? Would you take the classes? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I think I'm just too competitive. I'll always join in. So um, I'm really, like, okay. I don't know how you guys can okay. do it. no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how you guys can do it. Like, if I had to put up a session. I'll tell you how I sometimes do it. <laughs> I turn up at four o'clock in the morning. I saw that. And I'll train. Yep. And I'll train until there's nothing left. And then I'm in a good place where I can take everyone else for and, the session. And put us through hell. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty much it. But otherwise, I, um, otherwise I want to jump in. Mm, and I, Okay. Yeah. I, I actually, I do do that with my family. I do my training before I take them. Yeah. But I still jump in <laughs> to make them hurry up. <laughs> I'm like, hurry up. They're like, oh, silly, eh? Get away. Is that, your, um, is that your passion at the moment, just training? Or do you have other things that you like to do that I don't know about? Um, just training at the moment. Mm. I haven't um, – I'm such a boring person, eh? Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> like I um, – Quite the opposite, actually. I'm tr I just enjoy training. Um, if someone wants to ha handle something, if friends are in need elsewhere, I'll travel to them and help them. Um, I enjoy the, the break I had in Christmas was awesome mm. I just drank whatever I wanted to drink I was doing vortex here and there sending it to friends eating everything <laughs> and anything it was fantastic have you um, enjoyed um, since retiring have you enjoyed sort of life after or was it quite hard to make that initial adjustment it's, it's hard both? yeah um, people don't realise you know you People say, you, like, I enjoyed being retired. Like, I do enjoy being retired. But I find so much stuff to fill the gaps in from what I'm so used to. Because 16 years of my life was with Black Ferns and you're training three times a day um, and you're just constantly on the go. So your days will start early in the morning at 5, finish at 10. So I'm still in that spot now where I'm doing that. You know, um, my age is going up and the energy is sort of slowly coming down, but I'm still filling in those gaps. So, right. And if it's not one training, I'll be 
helping someone or so, someone just says, hey, do you want, are you keen to train? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm there. I don't know where I pull the energy from, yeah. but, you know, once you're there, um, you're going to give it 100. Mm. Uh, I'm just so used to it. Yeah. Um, even if I go to the beach or something, I'll be like in the water. Are you, you know. serious? Training? No, like, like I was bullying my nephew the other day. He was tackling him and telling him to tackle me so I could feel a bit better. Because, <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, my knees were right in the water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so um, I told him to try and tackle me and he couldn't, so I threw him. He's so, so I felt better. How old's your nephew? He's only like 13, 12, 10. Oh, wow. <laughs> nah, they got to learn, man. They got to learn. Yeah, he was trying to take me on. I said, nah. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I felt good, but then I poor thing. But he yeah. toughened up. Oh, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> he's my namesake, so. He's your namesake? Mm. Oh, he's got Fee in his name. Oh. Yeah. He's naughty. So the name can be both male and female? His name's Fasaya. Oh, I see. So he's see. got um, a bit of a little extra. Yeah. Now, nah, but mine, my, my nana. Yeah. Yeah. Um, something a little bit different that I wondered about before was, um, did you ever want to ever play for Samoa? Yeah, I did. Yeah. I did. Um, but I was snatched up by black friends quite early. Um, and Is it the same rules apply? Yeah. Like so once you represent... Um, stand down? Free year? No, I think it's... Um, for life. For life. So, um, yeah, I got snatched up by black friends quite early and I stayed with them. Mm. Um, and Samoa wasn't... They had a team, but it wasn't as consistent. But um, in saying that, I've always um, gone and played the village games, like um, so I can play along on those side. Those girls, like I've done Auckland Samoa. I've yeah. gone back to Samoa with the sevens Auckland Samoa seven team and played there yeah. against the Samoa girls, um, and that was a great experience. So um, I still, yeah, Pacific Samoa women's team that we have here, I'll still play, mm. even though we've got black friend stuff on. If you get injured in these games, nah, you, you always want to represent your. It's a different feeling, eh? Different feeling. Yeah. Like, I'll be... 2006 World Cup, I was celebrating with the Samoan team before we went over to... to um, Because well, it's just our girls. Yeah. Because you can... Um, you were having a good drink before we went over to the World Cup. And mm. then we... I was the only um, <clears throat> island and the Black Friends playing against Samoa. Wow. And, you know, we were singing their national anthem at the drink cup a week beforehand and here's me listening to them sing their national anthem and I'm, and I'm like sitting there crying you know, in line so it was quite yeah have you ever wanted to take on like a more of a coaching role at all and is that something that you've ever looked at I've never um, mm. no, I've always sure. enjoyed just playing rugby like I do um, we run some clinics like I'll go help girls and that but I've never um, thought about the co coaching side. So maybe further, maybe another couple of years. I just needed the break from rugby altogether. Mm. But when I'm playing, I'm always helping. Like you know, you always give tips and that kind of stuff. And but in order to really be retired from rugby, you just have to give up everything. everything. Up. Yeah. And do you not. still have much to do at all in a different capacity for the Black Ferns? Or no? No, right. not much at all. Um, we do have the Women's World Cup this year in New Zealand. Um, so we will be um, all hands-on. Like a lot of the ex-black friends will be, you know, helping definitely out. there helping out and um, supporting the girls. So it's going to be a, a good tournament. So mm. all those guys that um, said that the girls play good rugby, they better be out there supporting. That's right. Yeah. That's right. you got to be out there to actually see the real thing. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um also, as with your role in the police and you work a lot in the community, what is one of the biggest, um, I don't know if mistakes is the right word to say, mm -hmm. but one of probably one of the biggest mistakes that you see from our youth, one of the common most mistakes that they make that might derail them? I think a, a lot for me, like that I see, is that they leave school too early. Okay. Yeah, you stay in school. Um, and if there is a reason for you to leave school because you're going to do a course or something, you make just make sure that that's, you know, what you're going to go and do. When you say they leave school early, like at what age? 13, 14. Damn. Yeah, that, that's just too, too young. Um, and those are the kids that are out there, like, driving and you know, causing havoc with, because they think they're 21. 
it's like you don't realize that you're gonna get to that age enjoy your time as a child you know I'm sitting here at 26 years old you know um and I'm thinking man oh I'm glad I enjoyed that like when I was 12 years old I was still climbing trees yeah you know, I was enjoying, all I could do is play with my next door neighbours and doing chores at home. Mm. You know, you've got kids now that want to go and do this and that. It's like, live your kid's life and stay in school. Yeah. It's the main, that, that's my main one. Yeah. Um, a lot of it is social media too. Yes, I was about to say has that. a massive influence on our, on our young. And, and what and way? I'm quite in what way? Because stri- I work in child protection team. Yes. Um, a lot of the, let's say, pedophiles or, you know, a lot of the old grown-up men or just anyone that's interested in kids go into those sites. Right. And what parents don't realise yes. and what young people, they're like, these are a way of them grooming kids and that kind of stuff in, in, the, in those sites. And kids are vulnerable um, and they love the attention of, you know, someone saying nice things to them and that kind of stuff. So, and these are older people using fake profiles. Yeah, fake profiles. And sometimes it's the real profiles. Right. But they're getting away with it because it's on social media. And so our young are easily influenced into that stuff and they are allowed to go onto that stuff um, technology-wise because of phones and laptops that they have. And you're talking about just common sites. You're talking about like Instagram, mm. Facebook. Yeah. TikTok. TikTok, yeah. yeah. People, some people think TikTok's just for dancing and that, but people can get into profiles. Mm. Um, you've just got to be a computer geek in that and have a motive to just do whatever. Mm. So, yeah, our youngs. So, that, yeah, technology and social media have a lot of effect on our young. So you think parents should keep a tighter eye on their children using things like that? They should. No, but, and, well, it's hard, it's hard. It's hard. It's hard. Yeah, you know, yeah, it, it yeah. changes. That like, free to just you know, use. free to do whatever or use whatever. But it's like teaching our, just talking to our young too on, on the what can happen and if something does happen to talk to them, tell them. Yeah. Just being open with that, having that trust between the parent and the child to, um, to communicate mm. in that way. There's no point trying to say stop, to stop that, ban them because they're only going to rebel and go and do something else bad that's going to, I think just work with them, talk yeah. to them, but still um, let them know who the parent is. Yes. Yeah, because some of our youngs that I've seen these days just walk over their parents. Right. And when I see it in my job, I don't, I don't take it. What do you mean you don't take it? I'll be straight up and I'll tell that kid, you know. Right. And I'll tell the parent too. Right. Yeah, I'm quite. Um, straight up like that. Straight up in my my, in my job. Mm. Um, yeah, professionalism is definitely there, but when someone needs to be told, and the respect is a massive factor, not only in the Pacific community, but within the job as well. And if I see someone being disrespectful to someone, you know, a lot older, they need to be um, told mm. yeah, that it's it's not okay. Mm. Mm. Um, what was it like um, for you as a detective, as an officer, during lockdown? I actually quite, <laughs> this is going to be sad, I actually enjoyed the lockdown. Sure. There was so much room for us to move out there, like car-wise. Like <laughs> traffic was like five minutes down the road. I just had to wake up and drive down the road. Um, but I didn't like... Was there more crime? There, oh, or was it the us, same? There, there was, and we had a lot of search warrants that had to just build up before then because we had to help remove some kids because they can't be left in that environment. In that bubble. In that bubble. So if something came in that was serious, we would have had to go and um, deal with it. So that was busy. But we were quite fast getting there. We didn't even need our lights because it was yeah, yeah, like yeah. good traffic. But um, it was after lockdown that work started really coming through. In what way? Like what sort of things started happening? Just jobs that had back, you know, because Oranga Tamariki, yes. um, who we work alongside, they went... Um, they were also on lockdown. Yes. So they need to do their side before we can do ours. And right. In that way. So, yeah. Lockdown was, yeah, it was a, I'm just, it was a positive experience. For you. For, for me. Yes. But in, um, and in, like, in our area. Yeah. Like, because um, families were enjoying family time. Right. Because they were okay. all at home. Yes. 
But then it got to the point when it was probably four weeks down the track, five weeks down the track, then some stuff were coming through. <laughs> so right. they've had enough of each other. Yeah. Yeah. So what about the second lockdown then? Was that even worse? When Auckland went into level three? I think we were still trying to catch up on um, wow. the, f- the first lockdown um, work. So it was pretty much the same. Overall, generally, has there been um, having has there been more like an increase in things happening because of lockdown, in terms of crime, in terms of stuff's happening to kids? No, no, right. um, we're very lucky then. Yeah, yeah. For, like I didn't see. Did you think it would get worse? I actually did. Yeah. I actually did think it was going to get worse, but um, it sort of shows that kids just want their fam- parents at home, like. It's uh, some of the, it's just that love and support of just doing some family activities that yeah. were, because um, you know we get a lot of stuff c- come through of kids playing up, or and then the, the dad like you know is a smack, or and that and that comes through to us, but they kind of play up in that because they don't get the attention they get from parents because mm. the parents have to go out and work all the time. Mm. It's just how the our environment is or how our yeah. Our, you, Plus, parents are always stressed because of work and yep. don't have time for it. And but now everyone was trying to be active, walk the streets, stay in their bubble. Um, so, with the child protection, the area that we're always busy. So, um, the volumes of stuff that come through, mm. it's 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 just one big. Because um, if it's not one case it's another big case coming through right yeah and if we're not working on that case we get called to help out on um, bigger cases like operations with homicides and that kind of stuff mm. so another important question i think as well since you work on that child team um, is child abuse a brown problem no it's not just a brown problem it's a people problem thank you yeah um, there's a lot of misconception of the media i think sometimes that it is like a brown problem no all kids, doesn't matter what race you are, mm. they get abused. Um, it's not a good sight to see. Sure. Yeah, definitely not a good sight to see. But, you know, it just gets me thinking when I'm on the job, like, you know, there's parents out there that can't have kids and who will be the best parents out. And then you've got parents out there that are popping kids left, right, and centre, and they can't even look after them. Unfair. It, it pisses world. me off. Yeah. Like I'm sitting there, like, you know, this is so, uh, yeah, so unfair. Like I know parents out there that would be the best parents, dying to have a kid. Yeah, dying to have kids. It's to spend thousands of dollars on trying to conceive. Yep. And, and it hasn't happened. And you've got ones that can just have kids yeah. and not even look after them. Yeah. So, yeah, it just that's what I have to when I go to jobs and I, you know, I think. That goes through my head yeah. um, most of the time, and it's sad. Yeah, yeah, it's sad. There's a lot of what ifs, and but it's life, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is obviously going to go out to a lot of people that yeah. are listening or watching. Is there anything more that you wanted to say to like either young girls or young guys or people that potentially have a dream, but are in a situation where it's hard to see the light from the chaos that's around them? If you know what I mean. Yeah, just don't ever think that it's um, that you're not going to get there. Uh, you're always going to come across obstacles. You know, we're going to go through struggles, but that's the only thing that makes you str- um, stronger. If you overcome one struggle, um, one object, then you're going to overcome them more. Um, I always have the saying where um, you never lose; either you win or you learn. And that's one that I've gone throughout my whole life. I was like, I've never lost anything. I've always just learnt from it and gone again. Um, whether I win straight away, yep, that's cool. Whether it directs me to a different um, path, that's even better. But you, you're never going to lose. Um, you may not, um, don't ever think that money makes things work, that you're going to need money to get to it. It's, you're going to need people. People is what make things work. People is what makes or helps you get to certain areas. Um, if, and when you said um, ask for help, people and advice from people is also what gets you here there. So I'd love to be young again. Um, 
and experience and go through that path because I wouldn't change anything that I've gone through because I wouldn't be the strong person sitting here today if it wasn't for all those um, struggles or setbacks because um, they're you know, one step back pushes you three steps forward. But now just get out there and um, chase that dream uh, to within reach. And that's for damn sure. You just got to work your ass off. That's right. Yep. For you, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on. Thank you. And Thanks for having me. No, and thank you for your honesty and for everything that you've spoken about. I really appreciate it. And I'm sure everyone listening to this really appreciates it as well. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Yo, was the mic on, mic? It's in that mic on mic And pour us another one Let's do it right though mic We feeling nice though mic Gather round, gather round It's in that mic on mic It's in that mic on mic Yeah, garage drinks with mic Woo!